Go to the crowd. Oh my goodness. Okay. Well, Hello. Welcome to the Sound Girl session on audio software development. We are joined today with Colin McDowell. Colin has been creating audio project uh, products since the early 1990s. He graduated with honors from New Mexico State University with a bachelor's degree in electrical engineering along with minors in mathematics and economics in 1991. Before founding MCDSB in 1998, he was employed at IBM, DigiDesign, and Dolby. Colin worked on several projects during the time, including many DigiDesign plugins, including the original TDM, multi shell technology. Uh, this is amazing. And the Emmy Award, oh, uh, and the Emmy Award winning Dolby E Audio Encoder. Colin's work at MCDSB has garnered nine tech award nominations, two Electronic Music Editor Choice Awards, a Cinema Audio Society Award for Best Post-Production Product, and an Emmy Award for Outstanding Achievement in Engineering Development, as well as a few U.S. patents. Wow. When he's not writing code, developing new project products, or using uh, his uh, very hilarious persona <laughs> to demonstrate the latest technology for MCDSB. Colin enjoys spending time with his two daughters, uh, whether helping them with homework when their NASA scientist mom can't figure it out, which is apparently never, to attending ever soccer practice, ballet recital, ice hockey game, and more. Colin likes uh, being with his children the best. So welcome so much, Colin. I'm super excited to, to hear more about your work today. Okay. Well, thank you for that fine introduction. Um, I'd like to thank the Sound Girls people for having me. Um, I know they usually want to have, you know, smart people on the show, but well, today you got me. So let's just be clear. Um, there are some people who are smart, but there are some people who just have obsessive compulsive disorder and they can just channel it into something they really enjoy. And when you do something you really enjoy for every day of your life, you never have to go to get a real job. It's great. I highly recommend it. Oh, bye Ripley. I guess you're not going to stay with us. That's okay. Okay. It's all right. I'm not hurt. I'm, I'm not going to be sad because Ripley left because Ripley promised to read me a story, but then I guess the show started and we can't do it. Hey Ripley, how's it going? Can you believe it? COVID lasts for a year and a half. Don't worry, one day, kid, you're going to get outside, not wear a mask, play ice hockey with some boys and make them cry. You're going to love it. It's going to be great. Okay, anyway, sorry, I digressed. Okay, yes, as been mentioned, um, yeah, I got a double E with some minors. Um, maybe we left out the parts like I'm a lousy musician. I'm a hoarder of synthesizers and the ice hockey sticks. And uh, yeah, yeah. Um, a couple other things people I know people have some questions so I'm gonna to try to integrate some of the questions people have asked in some of my presentation but at the end there'll be time for plenty of Q&A like you know did I am I really this kind of way all the time yeah generally yes did your mom drop you as a child no actually I managed to crack my own skull open riding a bike without a helmet wear a helmet anyway another story what yeah and also there'll be lots of tangential stories that may have nothing to do with what we're talking about but that's just kind of how it works when you're kind of like you know trying to keep the obsessive compulsive thing channeled into this presentation but that's what you get okay Anyway, um, I really got started doing all this stuff when I was in Buffalo, New York, and we were like maybe a mile from the Moog music synthesizer manufacturing place. And um, some kid on my soccer team's dad worked there, and they knew I played piano and said, hey, you want to buy or borrow a synthesizer, Colin? I'm like, sure. And they said, you have to learn how to program it. I'm like, oh, okay. I took it home, and um, my parents didn't have a super nice house. My dad had a really nice stereo, which I destroyed in an afternoon with a you imagine a synthesizer with, you know, room, room, resonant filters and oscillators and stuff. And I don't know if everyone's into synthesizers here, but basically you can like really do a lot of crazy kinds of sounds with the synth. And that's what I did. And I blew up my dad's prize stereo. And he came home and he's like, Colin, what happened? And I'm like 10 years old this time. And I tell him, well, dad, I was taking the oscillator, you know, and I used a resonant low pass filter. And I thought the envelope, you know, the ADSR, I thought it was doing what I wanted, but I guess I just, you know, probably moved the resonant frequency to a too low of a frequency and blew out your speaker cones. And he was like, who are you? Hey, Jay, it's Colin. He's actually an idiot after all. There's something he's good at. He did kill my stereo, so you're going to pay for that. But, you know, so that, that was it. And my dad would give me engineering books and I was like 10 or 11. I'd be like, oh, well, this must be a low pass filter. He'd be like, Oh my God, because, you know, I'm not super awesome at school. I always struggled with, like, you know, spelling, vocabulary, um, you know, writing a complete sentence, 
um, math I really struggled with. Um, my parents, God bless them, just sort of like just helped me out and I sort of figured it out. So I, I want to definitely convey a point that, yeah, I have lots of smarty pants awards and patents and whatever, but mostly just because I found something I like to do and I just worked at it. Um, and I'll definitely emphasize that hard work gets you pretty darn far. There are lots of people who are smart out there, but they're lazy. Um, it's the people who actually have a combination of, yeah, some smarts and some good work ethic. That's what'll get you, get you going. It's kind of like, you know, live sound engineers, right? You think, oh, you just show up there and push some faders. What do you have to do? Well, that's the part of the job when everything works. Your real job is like when the poop hits the fan and you're like, oh, sorry, Ripley, poop's a word your mom will teach you later. Anyway, you know, that, um, you know, that like the, 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 there's a speaker that blows out or someone's amp is feeding back for a reason. And these problems you have to solve in real time, trying by thousands of people who basically hate you because the show isn't happening. That's what like live sound engineering is all about. And, and, and if you're smart or not, it doesn't really solve those problems. It's, it's you really work really hard to prep for the show, working at the show, have learned all these ways to fix problems. That takes a lot of hard work and effort over time and practice. That's what makes like a good live sound engineer. Anyway, I digress. Anyway, but anyway, my point is hard work is good for you. Um, so my parents figured out that I could program synthesizers. Um, they thought by the time I got to middle school, I should learn how to program some computers, which was kind of like a fad in like the early 80s. And so, oh, I have some right here because, you know, when you can keep everything, you might as well. So uh, my parents got me some books about programming basic on an Atari 400 and 800. That, that's a computer that had 48K of RAM. It was around oh, about the same time. So cool. as, yeah, when dinosaurs roamed the earth. Um, oh, and then the, uh, the TRS-80, or the PEP computer, if you guys seen these. This, this is basically a book, just, just how old am I? This is basically a book of computer programs printed out because they couldn't like send it to me in an email. And so my brother and I would copy the code. Like, I don't know if you can see all this stuff. They'd be like these, you know, lines of code in a program. And then we type it into the computer and run the program. So like, to show you how stupid I am, my brother and I once made a game. It's almost the equivalent of Angry Birds. We made like, you know, it was like, there was two points in the screen and there's a random number generator in between. It made a little mountain range. And then like, just like Angry Birds, you pick like an angle and a velocity and you shoot your little particle up. And I go down and try to hit the other person's like, you know, pixel and you go back and forth and take turns. That's what we should have done. All we had to do was like put like a pig and a bird in the screen it would have been done. Could have retired. Lived in Hawaii, gone scuba diving. Actually, I can't scuba dive. Water freaks me out. Anyway, I digress. That's how I got started. Can programming since and then programming computers in middle school and just kind of went from there. And I'm also so not a, yes. So what was your first computer? I'm sure it wasn't like a Commodore 64 or something like that. Was, was. was were you programming on an Apple? Or were you programming on a on a nope. Windows machine? Uh, or? No, I, 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 the Atari 800 was a computer my parents got because it was probably on sale at Sears. Um, that summer, I also learned on the VIC-20. It's a Commodore VIC-20, which preceded the Commodore 64. And that's what I learned uh, mostly basic on and Fortran which if you Google that later, you go, wow, this guy is ancient. I can't believe he's still living. Yeah, so that's what I did. And I just got into it. And, and because I liked sound and synthesizers, I'd always like, you know, cut the chase and go right to the, where can I program the computer to make a sound? And sometimes the sounds would be pretty lame, like a sine wave or something like that. But uh, sometimes you can make chords. Actually, the Atari 800 actually had a decent little synthesizer in it. Um, it was interesting. And, um, so, and the Apple IIe, I never had one, but my, my, when I went to college, the school had one. I think it's called an Alpha Centauri. It is a, a polyphonic synthesizer based around an Apple IIe with a five octave wooden keyboard. It was actually, if you ever find one of those, like a garage sale on eBay for 50 bucks, you should buy it because that synth sounded great. Um, Thank you. So there you go. Um, anyway, uh, so uh, what I'm going to do today is try to sort of walk people through a little bit of the development process for making a software plugin. It is my day job. I mean, that's what people want to hear about. But um, in addition to that, uh, I really got to emphasize that there are so many other jobs. It's not just the idiot writing the code, which is sometimes me. There are so many other roles to play um, in what we do when we're making a product that I thought I'd just try to make people aware of those things. Because um, I think when you all are, I guess, here to hear about jobs and audio software and hardware development, other jobs like in making audio products, um, you know, there's lots of stuff out there. Even for you, Ripley, that's right. When I want a new user interface, I give my kids a piece of paper and a crayon and go, draw something that looks mean. Okay, dad. And they go off and they do it and they would have something like, wow, it looks 
Okay, like this, everybody. Sometimes do that. People think I'm kidding. I'm totally serious. Um, anyway, oh, I wish I did. Yeah, Nicole, I have this picture of Helena in my lap, typing, and I'm typing. And it looks just like you. It's like, oh, what are you? I'm working. And then and Helena, they go, I'm working. Or she'd say whatever I would say. Which, just so you know, don't don't swear in front of your small toddler child when you're programming, because they'll learn those words, and then your wife will come home and go, "Hey, how come how come Helen is dropping those full letter words? What what words?" And then so, "Oh, Daddy, don't say this word," and they'd say it, and it'd be like, "Oh, that's um, I guess that's on me. My bad. Maybe she'll be a hockey player later. Cross your fingers." Anyway, okay, sorry, there, guys. So, in a more serious, let's talk about software development. I'm going to share my screen and show you folks a couple of things here. And here we go. I think, yeah, let's just show the desktop. No, let's show, why does it only show one thing? Fine, fine, fine. We're showing the desktop, stand by. Can you folks see what I'm doing here? Oh, that's the, that's the we after. sure can, yeah. Okay. And I don't think you see the sidebar here or if you don't, I'm just gonna hide it. But anyway, so like every product, it starts out, you can see this Royal Muse sketched cropped image, this pencil drawing, everyone sees that? Yeah. Okay, so yeah, yeah. Ripley's like, I can draw better than that. This guy's terrible, it's, it's true. Um, every idea starts out usually a crappy drawing, either on a piece of paper or the back of a napkin. So if you're the kind of person that just sits there and noodles around, maybe after you draw the crappy drawing about what the interface might look like, then you have an equally crappy drawing about the, maybe the flow diagram of the algorithm. This is what it looks like. And you start talking in amongst your coworkers and thinking, yeah, you know, maybe a dual channel compressor limiter with some linking capability, that would be cool. And then we start talking about features like, yeah, you know, but people really want to help us, want to be able to, like, to bias the super lows and the super high frequencies. Oh, I had a bias knob. Oh, okay. What about a coloring control like, like we did in some other similar product? Oh, yeah, we could do that. And so people start talking. At some point, you have like an idea of what the controls might be and stuff like that. And at some point, then now it starts to get divvied up and you have like the development team, which is like me making the plugin with a sort of crappy UI to start with. You have a graphic artist who eventually will come up with something like this. That's this, almost the same thing. Looks a little better, right? I mean, you actually might pay for that, um, but it's basically the same concept. Maybe a few things got refined um, and that's, that's sort of it. So um, maybe I'll unshare my screen now and go back to whatever. Cause you know, it's like, wow, that's it. That's the only screen share you're gonna do. Well, we might do other ones, but. Um, the point is, is that, you know, a lot of ideas are just worked on and refined and refined and refined. So um, some people think, that, oh, like, I'm just going to sit down and make the plugin or the thing I have my idea of. That's generally not how it goes. It's like you come up with a concept and you might make something that kind of works the way you think. And you, you sort of work on it with others or, you know, on your own until you get it into a place that's a lot better. Um, and sometimes some of those ideas are lousy. Like if you've heard about McDSP recently made this thing called the APB, this analog processing box. It's like the world's first programmable analog processor controlled by plugins, la, 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 patents, something, whatever, who cares? Yeah, but um, yeah, there are definitely some products we tried to make for that thing and it was terrible. It was like so bad. It was like, oh, we're just gonna kill this right now. Or other times like we're making it and we you know misconnect some part of the analog and the feedback to the computer and I'm sitting there with my headphones like, oh God and take off the headphones because I just shot my ears off. So um, anyway, so I guess I want to emphasize a lot of it's iterative and things like that. Um, so you're probably saying, okay, well, that's great. Can you vaguely describe what it is? And I see here, as you look to your side, you must have some kind of like little bullet point diagram that's helping you stay on topic. Yes, I am. Um, but I just wanted to sort of that general idea of lousy drawing to refine the product that, that, is, that is a big part of it. I think sometimes people think, that, oh, I'm just gonna sit down, type out a bunch of code, it's gonna work like magic. No, these products are all made with very small, deliberate steps. And sometimes you might think like this one deliberate thing I'm doing is really stupid. I could do five things, but no, because then you test the software, maybe you make a bug, maybe you make the program crash. So lots of small deliberate steps is the way it gets done. So that can make sense. Okay, anyhow, um, so I know that people have asked me some questions like about you know, algorithms, coding, all this stuff. So for, for, so for those people, we're gonna kind of get into some of that now, I guess. And I, I can share my screen if people would like me to, so I don't bang on the screen or wave your hand or 
fire something off in the chat like, wow, is this guy for real? I think he's kind of a basket pace. I think he got escaped from like a mental institution. That's probably true, but that, that'll come later. Um, but um, so I'm a DSP or for audio programming in general, um, all algorithm stuff is in a C. So if you're talking about skills, you want to know C. Um, all user interface stuff, you know, the knob, the widget, the panel, the meter, that's generally done with object oriented programming. Oh, uh, Shelly is C. Um, I said Nicole's not in your head, so is Ripley. Okay, good. They're a team. One of you be the UI person, one will be the algorithm person. Awesome. Um, then there's also a sometimes it's not just the programs, the code you write yourself, but there's like stuff that goes in the middle. And there's a big one called Juice, J U C E. That is a it's free. You can download it today. And Juice, it's it's horrendously, it's a horrendous pile of stuff. Like you might look at it and go, oh my God. Just just don't worry about that part, but just know that when you make like a plugin, this company called Juice will give you this whole SDK that lets you make plugins. And check this out: in one code project, it'll make a plugin that runs on the AAX plugin format. That's for Pro Tools, AU. That's you know Logic, um, other and, and VST3. Those are the three main for for Mac and Windows, all in one pile of code. So it's a really neat way to make a plugin because you know it can run anywhere so oh, i don't have pro tools oh, i only have reaper it'll work on any of those things and that's really neat. and it even has like example plugins in there like a, a basic eq or a filter i think they even have a synth these days so it's pretty neat but before you look at that juice thing because even for like nerdy people like me who've done it for a long time juices can be crazy overwhelming because it's like thousands of files into a library into your project it's just like <laughs> so sometimes i tell people if you're in class a lot of those online programming classes you see, although I'm not familiar with all the names of the current ones, but there's lots out there. You can just like take a class about, oh, I'll make a program. And the typical program is like called a hello world, which is what basically you write a program that just prints hello world in the screen, which I think um, is, Layla is a computer science student. So she's like, that is so dumb, but but so true. Yeah, you just start out with something basic. Because if you write some stupid, simple program, like it just prints hello, goodbye, or whatever, but in doing that, now you've gotten familiar with the compiler, compiling the code, running the code, debugging the code. You've covered all the things that you do, whether you were making like, I don't know, uh, uh, a flight simulator for the space shuttle or a computer program that just prints out hello world. It is the same process of, you know, compiler, build the code, debug the code, run the code. Everybody with me so far? Is this useful? I see some people writing down. I see Nicole nodding, but that could be her daughter like pulling in her hair. And she's like, oh, yes, I'm nodding. No, it's, that's my kid. It's all right. Oh, okay. Anyway, it's fine. So we're, we're good. Okay. All right. Anyway, so there's that. Um, but then people also ask, you know, well, how do you start to, um, okay, good. Um, how do you start making the algorithms to begin with? Because that, that's something else. Is it like you sit there and say, it's a lot of work just to make like a knob on the screen that turns, whatever, maybe a meter dances because audio goes by. That's a chunk of change right there. Then there's the, oh, what about the algorithm? Like, how's it going to work? Um, I tell people two things. One is that if you're into audio at all, like you had your favorite band, you know, Rush, Tom Sawyer. Ee, 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 ee. No one gets that joke. That's okay. Google South Park later, Tom Sawyer. There'll be like a skit. It's really funny. And you know, it sounds just like that, except, you know, probably better. Anyway, Nicole's nodding like, yeah, he's crazy. That's fine. Cool. Everyone else turned off their camera because they're like, oh, no, I'm not, I'm not talking to this guy. That's fine. Um, but because if you like music or the styles of music you like, or you have strong opinions or loose opinions about what is good or bad, that's a great start. Because then you're like, you know, like, you like, oh, I love this song, but listen to the snare. What is that? That sounds like someone like smacking their head against the desk. That's the worst snare sound ever. If you have like opinions like that, you are on your way to making an audio algorithm because you actually have an opinion. Um, or sometimes it's, it's more subjective. Like if you're making like a noise reduction thing, like you want to get rid of like the background noise and some recorded speech, like you're on a, like from like a, I don't know, home movie, or maybe you're doing a film for Warner Brothers and there's some, a, a car drives by, you think, boy, you know, if I could just make something that get rid of that car sound, but keep that person talking, that would be like so awesome. Yes, oh, that would be so awesome. Oh, I want to do that. So if those kind of ideas are already percolating in your head a little bit, then you're on your way. If, 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 you, if you just play an instrument, like you play, you collect synthesizers or play guitar, you have strong opinions about, oh, I like, uh, okay, let's just be nerdy. I like the memory mode more than the mini mode because the memory mode oscillators have more high frequency. So when you play a bass sound, it sounds really sizzly and awesome. 
and you put it in like mono mode and it's like super fat and you wake up the neighbors and you go, whoa, I might be talking about myself, but that's okay. But if you think about that, then you might think about, oh, this is how I should make an oscillator and what kind of like tones or, or sounds or waveforms it should have because you have opinions about the kind of sounds you like. Does that make sense? That's the first part. Second part is you want to learn some kind of software that helps you simulate some of these algorithms. Because um, I'm old, I use something called MATLAB, N-A-M-A-T-L-A-B. It's made by a company called MathWorks. Oh, good, everyone nods their heads because it's been around for so long. I worry the day that one day I'm going to say, oh, I use MATLAB. People will be all, wow, what's that? I'm like, oh, I see that company died. Well, how good. There is also a student version of MATLAB, which, you know, uh, back when I was in school, I think it was like a hundred bucks or something. The, the professional version of MATLAB is like five grand or something, but they have these tiered prices. And if you're a student or can establish you have a student something, you can get MATLAB for almost nothing. Um, in fact, even recently, uh, either it's a feature in MATLAB or someone else did it with Juice. They made a program that would convert your MATLAB like audio algorithm script into a Juice VST plugin. So you have to, oh, okay. So at least I don't like, and, and MATLAB itself also has the ability to like, you know, take in an audio file, apply your algorithm to it and you know, poop out the audio file. So those are, are, and it also has lots of like, you know, plots and graphs. So if you think like, oh, I thought my attack time was too fast. You know, when that snare hit, you could actually like plot over time, you know, the audio and the, the, the you know, the audio waveform along with like the you know, attack and release of like a compressor or something. So you can get those kind of uh, visual feedback that you need to make an algorithm effective. On um, this point, you might be saying, why aren't you sharing your screen for that, Colin? Uh, I'm not gonna show you folks everything because I sometimes forget that some of the MATLAB scripts we have, oh, it's crazy proprietary, you can't see that. So I'm not, not doing that part. Anyway, blah, 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 blah. Um, okay, so I talked about C for algorithms generally, C and C++ for the UI. I talked about Juice, which is a great SDK for making plugins that will run everywhere, anywhere. I should also caveat, Juice also makes like layers of or SDKs. If you want to make a, a mobile app that runs on iPhone and Android, Juice does that. If you want to make a standalone application like Pro Tools that runs on Mac and Windows, Juice does that. They do all kinds of stuff. It just so happens it's been very popular in the audio industry and not just companies like McDSP or giant conglomerate of like, you know, 10 people, but you know, Roland, Korg, Moog, Yamaha, Steinberg, you know, a lot of them all use Juice. So even if you just had some some experience with Juice, that would actually be a good like bullet point to put in your resume. Like, oh, I can program C, C++, I've used Juice before, that would be good. Um, okay, so that was some of that. Um, everyone with me so far? Yes, no, maybe so. We're okay, stuff, okay. Yes, my office is cluttered, but that's what you get when you're old and collect all these things for years and years and years. Oh. Min said I'm okay. Thank, thanks, Min. Okay, awesome. Can I ask a, a really basic question because I really haven't done much coding? Yes, is so my hair like this naturally? Yes, this is this is my real hair. It spikes in the middle. I don't know what happened. It also grows up in the back instead of down. Don't ask me why. That's my mom's fault and my dad's. Yes. Like, so a macro is like, that would be a programming language like C++ and then there's scripting language. Have we oh. talked about any scripting languages? I'm going to talk about that later. Languages is like how you can actually, like it's kind of easier to understand for people like me, right? Well, if you can actually write maybe. scripts, then then C or whatever the heck else is, is this, it's the same stuff. You know, there's a, okay. there's, a, there's a thing, there's an if, there's an else, there's a variable, it's great. And people think, oh, well, scripting, I just want to write code. I don't want to write scripts. Or, oh, I just write scripts. I can't write code. No, 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 it's all the same thing. It's just a different language. There's Perl, Bash, whatever. And we use all that stuff. If um, you use any of those types of scripting languages in a Unix environment or anything else, and I think, you know, your other computer science majors here will go, oh, yeah. Um, like for McDSP, it's like when we release a plugin, I'm not doing it from my laptop here. I'm like, we have a whole other set of computers that builds the software with scripts. That's the only thing those computers do. And they put it into installers and they give it little version numbers and they tack on the release mean read those, wrap it in an installer and go boop, here you go. It, it's like it's like that Willy Wonka, like one of those crazy Willy Wonka machines that you guys have seen Willy Wonka and Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. Gene Wilder is kind of crazy, right? No, 
Like, okay, see, Nicole's yeah. not in. It makes me feel bad. Nicole's like, oh yeah, I know that because I have a kid. Of course, I know Willy Wonka. Although the scene where they go down the tunnel, is it raining? Is it pouring? That kind of freaks kids out until they're about seven. So just you know, make sure they're close and that like you know, because then they won't like the movie and you can't watch it. And you'll be stuck watching like the Flintstones for like you know six years. Okay, I digress. Yeah, I have the Oompa Loompa song in my head. Thanks. For that. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. There you go. <laughs> Um, okay, thank you for explaining. Okay, and yes, it still freaks people out. That's that's probably true, but um, it, yeah, okay. It, it, it actually is pretty freaky. But my point is um, that that the idea, if, if you do like write macros or scripts or things like that to accomplish things that, that you're already doing in your job, um, that's programming. That's flat out programming. So don't anyone tell you that it's not. Um, you know, it's just, you know, like with a language like C or Fortran or basic or whatever, there's a compiler that actually people, oh, compiler, compiler, my code, I'm freaking out. No, it's fine. In fact, the compiler is great. The compiler is like, this is wrong. This is wrong. This is wrong. In fact, now like a, the de facto compiler for the Mac is called Xcode. Um, you can get it from Apple for free. Uh, Windows is generally Visual Studio. Um, but uh, they'll tell you not only like what's wrong, they'll make suggestions. Did you mean this variable? Did you mean this? Did you mean this constant? And sometimes it's like really helpful. And sometimes it's like super annoying. Like I just want to have an I, you know, for a loop or I equals zero to something. So did you mean injure infinite? And I just, just, just be quiet, stop. So, but yeah, but um, so, so compilers, I think have become more and more, I think user-friendly sort of. Um, there's other things like Swift from Apple and other types of sort of layers of code that people can use to write other programs more quickly. And those are great. Um, probably mostly based on my age and what I do for a living. I don't use a lot of those. I just flat out we have, we use juice. I write C code and C++ in MATLAB. That's more or less the extent of my job. Um, for some of you, I'm not sure if anyone here is like a, like a double E like me. There's a whole other world called embedded systems where you have like things on little DSP chips, which also sometimes freaks people out. But again, there's compiler tools that make it way more manageable than, it, I mean, back when I was, back when I, sorry. I'm old, 52. Don't, you'll get there eventually, but try not to. Stay young. Old is bad for you. But um, assembly code. Um, if you ever, like if you're getting a computer science degree and have a chance to take a class about assembly code or like operating systems, it's not a bad idea um, because sometimes you'll just be working somewhere and like at McDSP, we have this APB product. Well, guess what? You know, that has drivers and stuff like that. And you're almost running, you know, machine level code or assembly code. And some DSP systems still, um, they're still made today. They want you to write assembly code because you just want to control what's happening instead of letting of a compiler. And I'm, I'm sorry if I'm jumping around a bit, but it's like language-based programming like C, Fortran Basic. That kind of that code is then translated into assembly code, which is then compiled into a binary for the computer to understand. So assembly is kind of like the, the middle ground. Um, and sometimes just because you want to control something like you don't want any interpretive compiler things happening, you can write the assembly code for it. The, the DigiDesign or sorry, Pro Tools system that preceded the current one, the, you know, the, the HDX systems, before that there was one called HD or HDXL that used Motorola DSP chips. So it was all, um, it was a style of DSP chip called a 56,000 and all the programming for that, all the algorithm stuff was all done in Motorola 56,000 assembly code. Blah. But um, but once you got used to it, um, it actually made a lot of sense because when you were troubleshooting your algorithm, there was never any like, I wonder if the compiler is treating this float as an integer when I typecast it, blah, blah. That's all gone. It's just like, there's like four inputs, X1, X0, Y1, Y0, two outputs, A and B, and some registers to point to memory. You're like, that sounds like a nightmare. It was, but once you got good at it, it made total sense. But when you're sometimes writing algorithms or if you're like booting up, I mean, forget, you know, old antiquated um, Pro Tools systems. Uh, Universal Audio, they make all these audio interfaces, you've probably seen them. Every one of those has someone there, a chip with it, it's been programmed possibly with assembly code. So just when you turn it on, it just boots itself up. And sometimes people prefer to do that with, instead of an interpretive language, like with assembly code, just so they know what's going on. Does that make sense? So I'm sorry, I got off on a tangent there, but I'm, anyway, people are like, okay, yeah, all right. Uh, oh, oh, someone's a, wait. <gasps> Nicole's a double E. Oh, I'm not telling you nothing. Yeah, I'm not telling you stuff like Jackson's rule. Oh, I said too much already. That show's over. No, it's okay. Anyway, talk about that later. Um, so to answer some, I talked about some programming languages. I talked about some things. And there's not just MATLAB. There's lots of other, um, 
you know, a little dumber than doubly. No, you know, some doublies are pretty dumb. Hey, I know one's name is Colin. You should talk to him sometimes. Real basket case, so it rattles on a lot. Anyway, so talked about languages, talked about um, juice, talked about MATLAB. There are other ways to prototype algorithms. Um, so don't just be stuck on MATLAB, but I know that MATLAB has, MATLAB has a student version that's surprisingly, I think it's still like a hundred bucks, might even be free these days. But anyway, I, I recommend that. Um, yeah, so, there, so there's those things. Um, and I talked about how if, if you just like audio in general, have opinions about what's a good or a bad sound, that really gets you a long way. If, like some people have indicated, you're good at writing macros or scripts, yeah, you're already programming. That, that's programming. So don't be, oh, I can write a macro. And just uh, that, that's, that's good. That's good. That's good. That's good. Um, okay. So am I doing okay so far? Is this decent? We're okay. So I, I sort of gave this like a you know, very, you know, talkative way of describing how we do a plugin. Um, I suppose if you wanted, I could show you guys like what a code project kind of looks like. Would that be interesting? That, that's a little like super nerdy. Like, hey, let's look at an Xcode project and tromp through some code and be like, oh, well, it's so interesting. I think you just put my two-year-old to sleep. Thanks a lot. You know, that's great. But um, I think it would be cool to see that. Okay. Personally. Then we'll do a little bit of that. So I'm gonna uh, share my screen again one more time. We're going desktop. Oh geez, and share. Okay, so you guys saw my 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 drawing things stuff. Yeah. Okay, so let's. Right, let's go. Wow, his desktop is a mess too. Of course it is. I mean, what else would you think it would be? Um, oh, that's the artwork. But like um. Uh, let's look at, let's go, yeah. So like, yeah, so we'd like put, you know, like all our, like all our plugins, you know, like go, all our plugin projects go into a folder that we have like ones for AX code or ones for, you know, other types of code, v AUVST, stuff like that. I guess yeah, that's not as, as cool as this. Um, let's get rid of that too. You guys can still see this, right? You're all like, okay, I see what you're doing. Yeah, we can see it. Okay, so um, like you know, this is an AX plugin called the 4020 Retro EQ. Um, everyone should feel sorry for the 4020 Retro EQ because every bad idea we've ever tried is always tried out on the 4020 because it's the one at the top of the list of all our products. It's, it's, it's just like, it's like, it's like a four band EQ with some filters and input output control. So, oh, the 4020 is really easy. We should try it in this one. So we're always like breaking the 4020 EQ. It's very sad. Um, but you know, uh, let's pick on. So this, is this, is this legible enough for you folks? I think, is it, is it okay? But like, you know, there is like, uh, like here, like we're just talking about, we're making like a, let's pick on this one. This piece of code here that I'm highlighting, you know, it's, oh, it's a lot of line of code. Oh my God, it's terrible. It's fine. How's this? We got a variable called A input gain. It's a AXC parameter. So we're making a new one of these because this is an object or anything. We're making an object that's this control. It's got an ID. It's got a text name that humans can read. It's got a default value. It's got a minimum value, a maximum value. Sometimes you want to give it a little decoration. See, it says decorator. That's like units. Don't you want to be DB? Do you want to be automatable? I sure do. How many control steps will you have? Oh, we're done. And then we just add it to some big list of parameters and a manager. That, that was, you're like, wait, what? But that wasn't hard, right? That was like, I mean, yeah, there's a lot of lines there. Kind of annoying to read, but it's not, not bad, right? You know, um, easy stuff, right? I mean, not easy, but pretty basic. Go over to like, so that, and, and this parameters file is part of what, you know, setting up the code to actually change the actual controls and do stuff like that. On the other side of things, we have like, a, let's go back up here. Yeah. We have like um, this other, sorry, on the left hand side here in this column here, these are some of the files that are part of the project that is, you know, what the McDSP plugin is. Um, I showed you, a, I showed you this class before I'll show you one more the plugin editor this is just the user interface the user interface the same kind of thing wow, where is it come on come on come on come on come on there you go look at that this piece could have highlighted right here i'm um, just the knob that controls that parameter i showed you in the other file 
there it is. There's a variable called M input game slider. It's tied to some enumeration of the controller because all the controls, you just, you can't call them like, you know, Ray, Bob, you know, Nicole, Ripley. It's not gonna work. It's gotta be like, you know, zero, one, two, three, four, five. So like, here's the enumerated control value. Here's the, the point it fits on the screen. This is like a juice thing. The LAF is short for look and feel. So you can say, hey, it's like a knob. It's got this many points. It looks like this. When you turn it, it goes, ling, 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 ling. there you go. And I call a routine called setup knob and does its thing, right? I mean, that's like one line, right? That's not so bad, right? So we kind of like, I, what I want to get from this is that don't, when people write code, it's like, yeah, don't, work, you work on small parts. I mean, there's like, you know, there's like, I don't know, a couple hundred other files in this project. We're not talking about that. You know, we're just doing the user interface, some parameters. So does that kind of make sense? You put it all together and yeah. So there's there's some of that. So maybe I'll stop sharing my screen, something, no wait, trying to control. Hey, so my rambly point there, I mean, like, wow, that was a really amazing presentation of some code. And I think your coding style is kind of crappy. You're all about like extra spaces and extra lines. Yeah, I don't want to go on one line that goes way over there. Anyway, but conceptually, we all just kind of like, I think hung out with that, right? There was like a parameter, it had a name, it had like a minimum value, a maximum value, had some number of steps and we chucked it into some like, you know, other object that's just gonna keep track of all our parameters, great. Then there was a UI that said, hey, I'm like a knob on a screen. I had this look and feel. I go like at, you know, this pixel point, you know, number of X pixels, number of Y pixels, put it on the screen right there, ooh, I'm done. So that was all pretty manageable, right? You know, we didn't talk about, I don't know, the copy protection integration or some other crap or how to optimize the algorithm. Uh, that's fine. You know, but um, that was all doable, right? That was not intimidating in one bit, right? Say yes. You know, and yes, we have other plugins that you look at and I look at and go, okay. Like like the Revolver plugin. It's a big convolution engine which uses like this just this really complicated way of like doing an FFT, which is a fast Fourier transform. And it does it like in the frequency domain with an offsetting thing and the F and just so you can have it all in real time. And it's all scheduled out. So all the bins, you know, like that, like, that's later. You get a double E degree and maybe a minor and you go, oh, I'm doing that one. If you're just doing like, I'm just making like, I don't know, volume control. That totally is doable by anybody. And, and Juice has some examples. Juice has some equalizer examples too that are, you know, kind of, but anyway, it's trying to demystify this it's just code is not really that complicated. You just got to take small deliberate steps and you'll be okay. It's kind of like when you get your, I'm just going to pick on Ripley the whole whole thing because she's just too cute. You know, it's like when Ripley wants to go to bed and you want her to go to bed, but you can't say, okay, go to bed. That's not how it works. You're like, well, let's read some stories. Maybe, you know, let's lay down because it's getting dark outside. Oh, look, here's one about the little girl who's going to sleep and, and, Yay, and there's stars and rainbows and cows, and the cow says moo and the sheep says ba. Three little pigs say la la la. These are like little children's books jokes I'm making now. And I think maybe Nicole would be like, oh, I, I read that book. The moo ba la 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 book. See? Yeah, see? I, I, yeah. Anyway, so yeah. And you'll read that book. And like, wait, when your kids like graduated from college, you'll be going, sheep says moo, the cow says ba. Three little sheeps go la la la. The pig says oink. The, the, I must have it memorized. Wow. Yeah, I read that one to Helena. Helena's like 22. So um, yeah. And uh, anyway, also just for that one, speaking of languages, uh, small children are a great example of how you can absorb languages if you're just into it. Like kids are really into like learning how to communicate because having to cry to say, I want another like, you know, Pop-Tart, that's really difficult. But if you can just say, mommy, I want another Pop-Tart and I love you so much, even more than dad, Bambi eyes, you know, well, that's what they want to do. But, you know, crying is like, I can't tell you what I want. So I'm just going to cry until I get something. This isn't what I wanted. Right. That's, that's how it'll go. But so kids really want to learn languages. So by the time your child is like two or two and a half, they know thousands of words. They may not say all those words, but they know thousands of words. So don't teach me any bad ones. Anyway, but so same thing. If you want to learn how to do some programming, if you're into it, you know, sometimes I encourage people, if audio is your thing, use audio as like the motivation to learn the programming language, you know, for loop, a while loop, but if then else statement, all that stuff you can see online in online courses. But if you always think about it in the context of, oh, if I had like a compressor and it had two states, you know, maybe one for like really loud signals and one for really quiet signals, oh, that would be an if then else. Oh, that's what this is all about. Or like, um, if you, if at some point, like if you're like, you're a doubly like me and you learn about filter design. Oh, I have that book, hold on.
sorry. I know we're recording. Also, if you want to put two-year-olds to sleep, sometimes you can pull out some of these double E books and yeah, they'll fall right to sleep. I tell you, it's it's effective stuff. But um, of course, now you're playing. Are you telling me you kept all your books from college? Um, yeah, pretty much. Um, because I found them useful, at least the ones about signal processing. Where is it? Oh, come on. This looks oh. like a very well-loved book, too. I threw it through a wall once or twice, too. I'll have to tell you that. Gosh, John, I always have it marked, and I'm like, now it's like it's not here. I'm sorry. Oh, I'm basically like everyone's seen like a synthesizer low pass um, resonant filter, right? And um, oh, it's it is in here. I think I think the tab fell out. That that's how old I, I'm. So old that tabs I put in books like 30 years ago have fallen out. And now we're going to record this and watch me thumb through my Nilsson's Circuits book to find the thing I'm just fixated. Oh, there it is, right there. Careful. So, like, does that look like anything to anybody? Like, maybe like a resonant high pass or a low pass filter? Yeah. yeah. So, like, any double E degree you get, they'll tell you exactly this stuff over and over again, six times sideways. You can do it this way or this way with op amps or LRC, RLC circuit. Oh my God. But it's all out there. And if you like music or something, you know, like, so I took this filter design class and I was like, oh yeah. Like, the first day the professor was like, you're Colin, Colin Wachow. Yes, sir. Heard about you from the other professor. He says you're into um, music synthesizers. Yes, sir. Just don't sit too close. Okay, I can do that. That's even before COVID, you know, but he's like, oh, I'll stay away. But yeah, so, so I, at that time, I think you can use music as a motivation to learn some of the more complicated things. Um, I guess on that topic, um, I know maybe math is not everybody's favorite subject. Math, you know, math, fractions, decimals, logarithms, blah, blah, blah. So I'm gonna tell you a funny joke. It's really funny, funny, funny. And my wife, the applied mathematics master's degree teacher at Santa Clara University is gonna go, that's not funny. I see, why do you tell people that? It's true. So everyone's heard about calculus, ooh, whatever. Um, there's this joke in calculus that you only get after four years of it. If you take all four semesters of calculus, that's derivatives, integrals. Then you got like a three-dimensional or two-dimensional calculus and they throw in some like Fourier series, I don't know, vectors, crap like that. I guess it's mostly vectors, whatever. And then differential equations. At the end of differential equations or in a fifth class, they will show you this thing called, and this is something you should write down, the Laplace transform, L-A-P-L-A-C-E. You go, oh, the Laplace transform. Oh, well, that sounds like something that I'd want to read at night when I'm like having insomnia, which is true. But um, so, this guy named Laplace was one of the first of many people to realize that a lot of complicated mathematical things like calculus can be broken down to algebra that you probably learned in the seventh grade. So most signal processing and filter design, just letting the cat out of the bag, I'm not sitting around going, I'm going to make an integral to do a thing to get my compression curve to look the way I want to do it. I'm not doing that. I'm getting some complicated thing. And I go, okay, this is getting too complicated. And then um, we chuck it into the, do like some kind of transform um, in signal processing. There's one called the, um, oh, I forget the name of it. That's terrible. So I have these books here. Because when you get old, you also forget things. Like your wife's what? friend's name, what? Your wedding. What? That's really awkward. Elizabeth, her name's Elizabeth. Yeah, you're going to ask me. Well, I knew the answer. You tell Diana I knew the answer. Elizabeth. What was the name of that well-loved book that you were showing us with the, oh, that one. With the low that pass? That's uh, Electric Circuits. Um, second edition, it's, it's, Nilsson is the author, that's what matters Thank most. Um, yeah, and if afterwards, or if people want to email, I have a list of books that people ever want. But um, look at this other guy here. Good, oh, man. don't get old. Y'all see the thing called bifocals? They're really inconvenient. Because it's, it's one thing to get old and get dumber, but then when you can't even read your own writing anymore, and people are like, why? It's, it's, everything's blurry. And they're like, oh, why is it blurry? And I'm like, well, it just kind of looks blurry because, you know, everything's blurry. But um, yeah. But uh, anyway, this is another book I like by Lonnie Ludeman, one of my professors. It's super old. Uh, so it's uh, Fundamentals of Signal Processing, but that's the it, Ludeman. Kind of sounds like Rudeman, but he's not rude. He's a nice guy. Just imagine some tiny guy with glasses going, hey, everybody, you want to hear about signal processing? It's really cool. That's about what he sounds like. Sorry, sorry, Professor Ludeman, if you're out there. 
watching this class, but that, that is what you sound like if you're still alive. Okay, hope you're still alive. Um, that book is, has pretty much everything you need to know. I, I, I can tell you that, you know, McDSP is, came out of that book, this book right here. Um, in case you wonder why it says free Kuwait on there is because um, just a little, so when, when Kuwait was invaded by Iraq, like in 1990, that's when I was taking this class. And then I had three classmates that were from Kuwait. And I go, hey, what are you doing? It's like, I'm trying to call my parents. What for? You forget something? No, I'm just trying to call them because Iraq just blew past their city. We don't have cell phones or iPhones back then. I just want to call them, make sure things are cool. Oh, they're like, hey, will you take one of our stickers? I'm like, yeah, yeah, I'll take a sticker. Put it on my book. And I'm like, yeah. So every time I sat in this class going, this class is so hard. I'm going to just try to get Well, Oh, hey, I could call my parents anytime I wanted. So that's what that sticker's about. Yeah. Anyway, um, so um, that class, it, if so do not buy the hard copy version of this book. It's like 200 bucks. I don't know why. But you, on Amazon, you can find a, a soft copy book for like five bucks. That's the copy you should buy, used. In it, there's a chapter zero, which does a great job of explaining like what digital signal processing is. Talks about like an array of, well, I got it right here. Um, ah! Oh yeah, it's high quality here today. Everyone see that picture? So it's kind of talking about how there's a set of memory states that over time, every, each sample, the memory states will change or the samples will advance one sample. Is that, oh, there you go. Yeah, um, gosh, it's kind of blurry, isn't it? I'm sorry. Um, anyway, but, but that's it, right? That there's like, there's like a, an array of samples that comes in, chink, 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 chink. there's like an array of coefficients that you apply onto the samples of audio, chink, 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 and just ins to outs, ins to outs. That's all this. So this, this book, like chapter zero, I mean, at the time, maybe I didn't quite get it when I read it, but um, as I get older, I'm like, this chapter zero makes such good sense. Or at least it gives you an idea of, oh, that's what it is. It's like an array of memory that has your filter coefficients or whatever you're doing, an array of memory that has like your audio, they kind of come in, they do this thing called convolution and you're off to the races. So, um, which is really oversimplifying it, but um, that's good. Not, not every algorithm works that way. That was like an FIR filter, finite impulse response filter. And if someone understood what that meant, great. If you don't, don't worry about it. Google it later, doesn't matter. But but that is, that's it, right? So I had a big tension there about my mathematical joke was that if you look at calculus, which is really complicated, and it is, and lots of math, it gets pretty complicated. But then at some point, somebody, Laplace, Fourier, uh, other people have made some transform, which puts it into math that's about the equivalent of like seventh grade algebra. Then you're like, well, that's easy. What the hell? What are you doing? And yes, you have to learn all the calculus first so you understand what you're doing with the other thing. But at some point you're just like, so yeah. So it's like, if you were like me, I was like a junior in my double E school and we, we learned about the Laplace transform in like two classes at the same time. And in the class, I'd be like, oh, are you blankety blank kidding me? We took like two semesters of it this other way. This is like, this is to do. It builds character. You make Colin, Colin McGow. Yeah, you need to just come down. I'm fine. I'm fine. Everything's fine. I'm, I'm good. I'm fine. Everything's great. People, stuff. Anyway, so there's that. So I want to do people with Nicole think, oh, I'm only an EET. I'm not an EE. Whatever. Um, the, uh, 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 the nature of a lot of signal processing stuff. I don't, I, I think there's a lot of, times where people who are maybe a little more academic than I am might get a little arrogant or be like, oh, you know, it's got the uh, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, you know, uh, no. Um, you know, when it comes to like writing programs to do algorithms, audio, satellite networking, making your cell phone communicate to someone else's cell phone, you know, those, all those things have been broken down with some type of transform math into something way more simple. So, so I just, and I know that maybe taking up as far as like calculus and stuff. It's not everybody's cup of tea. I struggled with it. It was very difficult for me. I had a classmate named Marcos Medina um, who helped me through many classes and he was just patient and way smarter than me. I used to always also wonder, why is this guy at the school with me? You should be like at Stanford or something. Oh, my older brother got into Stanford. My parents didn't have enough money to send me. I'm like, oh, okay, I'll shut up. And so, you know, um, something like that. Anyway, um, uh, but, yeah, so, so was that okay? 
that was a lot of like sort of off topic stuff. I talked about. So, I guess I. I oh, my question, Nicole talks. Yeah, okay, yeah, she's great. I, I speak. Yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> but I, I thought um, since you did mention like some people are a little bit uppity about about their math abilities and and that sort of thing, a lot of times um, the job listings for for DSPs and and those sort of companies are asking for EEs rather than EETs and that sort of thing. So I was just wondering. Uh, if like if there is that culture of kind of that that um sure i'll answer the question two ways no. uh one is a uh, yes there's a company called google maybe you've heard of them they're in silicon valley when google started they wouldn't hire you unless you went to stanford because they're from stanford and you're like wow what a bunch of anyway hope you're not listening google they're like a mile over there but um so, so there's actually still a stigma at places like Google, where if you didn't go to Stanford, like, oh, you only went to Santa Clara University, where they invented discrete math, which is used by half the signal processing stuff on the planet. Yeah, well, you know, I don't know if we can hire you right now. And so, yes, there is some of that, but why would you want to work at those kind of places anyway? Then there's the other ones where they say that they want to double E. Does, I think this is still a thing, ABET, A-B-E-T, ABET accreditation. They're just looking for people they want. They say it, they spell it like double E or M E or whatever. It's because they want that level of whatever they think they need you to know. Well, so some, uh, some, some EET schools are a bit accredited as well. So yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Not that it's not that the EET or the EE degree isn't um, a accredited, but just because there's a standard of what they think the person would know. They just kind of oh, I think we want a double E. They put it out there, but then they may not realize oh, here's like an EET. Well, gee, you know, this person had I don't know some programming experience. They knew how to do certain types of circuits. And, and so there, there, could, there always can be matches in there. You know, there are many people like like pretty high level hardware design double E people. They flat out started as like a, not even an EET. They were like a tech. They learned how to solder, you know, maybe like fixing microphones or something. And they got into like repairing synths, for example. And they got good at that. And they saw how all the circuits work and they sort of understood how those things like like actual real world circuits are put together, how the, you know, how the circuit boards are laid out, what were good soldering things or ways to like do all your wiring traces. They did all those things. Then they went back and got a double e degree. And now they work like, you know, line six, universal audio, Avid, designing all the hardware that we, all of us are using to do all the audio processing on. So am I, I'm kind of answering your question. So yeah, there are some snobs out there. Why would you want to work for them anyway? Just forget about them. And there are other people who are just, they're just trying to say, oh, I wanted someone who, is this degree because I'm thinking you have these skills. So you can kind of can infer from the job description and think, oh, we really want, I'm sorry, Nicole, we were looking for a double E because we wanted somebody that was good with operational amplifier design. And if you're like, I don't know, well, actually, I've been like, you know, 60 of those because I did the thing with the thing, the thing. Like, oh, really? Wait, where'd you go to school? Oh, well, maybe we'll get you a phone interview or something, right? So just it's it's a matter of this a lot, mostly companies are just looking for matches. And so it's it's not fair to put labels on people or types of degrees, but they're just looking for like like caliber of skill and so if there's like an if you're looking at a particular company like i don't know maybe like maybe like maybe 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 everybody everybody nicole she collects guitar pedals she has 2550 guitar pedals she hides it behind her background bread thing but it's really a big shelf of guitar pedals and she has thousands of them Shh. and ripley thinks it's normal anyway right but you know so therefore if you like, I don't know, just repaired a bunch of guitar pedals, you'd have all these ideas that a double E out of school have no idea about, about, oh, this is why an Ibanez TS9 is cool. This is why the Roland Boss CE3 does this. La, 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 la. So all those types of things are, are really good skills to have. And I, I would never sell yourself short. I mean, if you asked me to solder right now, I'd be like, no, because it would be so bad. It would just be terrible. Between my need for bifocals and that I was terrible at it in college, there was only one project I did it really well. And I was so fixated on soldering, we made a calculator, you know, because that's how old I'm. Whoa, calculator. But that's what you do because you can add the numbers and you can see it like in the hex and it's, you know, you demonstrate that it actually works. And I was so fixated on making the soldering neat because I really struggled with that. I didn't keep track of all my wires and because I was a moron. And it was also over the holiday, it was over Thanksgiving break. Between Thanksgiving, you know, you know, it was, you know like some of you people in Canada, but you know, so American Thanksgiving, you know, right after the last Thursday, November, you know, Freaky Fridays, Black Monday, all stuff. So that weekend, I had to do this project. I only had red wire. So I did this whole thing with red wire. 
And because I was worried about tracing each wire, instead of like putting it along the circuit boards, I just did these big loops. So I could just follow it with my fingers. And it worked the first time. But when I turned it in, TA was like, you should not ever solder again. This is, and I still have it. It's, not, it's in a box somewhere in this office. It just was like, anyway, did I answer your question, Nicole? So yes, there are some job descriptions that are looking for a double E. Okay, you're good, right? I'll, I'll shut up, I'm sorry. Yes, okay, sorry. People are like, wow, this guy talks way too fast. Or maybe not, I don't know, something. Okay, is this still useful? We're good? Are we recording this? We are, wow. Well, you can always edit it down, you know, and the part how to get up and get another book and come back. Well, we'll keep all the parts with Ripley because she's so cute. One day, oh, it's Ripley, I know her. Wow, she's got like six engineering Emmys for making the most amazing audio thingamajig ever. And I knew her when she was two. I got you started, Ripley, I should get 10%. Anyway, okay. Um, and please, anybody either in the chat or just unmute yourself and interrupt me, I'll be fine. So I've talked about, you know, programming languages. I kind of showed you some code, MATLAB, simulating stuff. Talked about some like, you know, degree stipulations that people may or may not want for a job. I thought that I'm, gosh, how long time is it? Oh, it's already like an hour. I'm sorry, I just talk a lot. But um, I've only talked about one thing. That's basically product development, which is great. And yeah, and, and I'll, I won't kid you, some people are good at it and some people aren't. Um, I, when I say I have obsessive compulsive disorder, I'm not kidding. My wife can tell you about times I've woken up in my sleep because I have fixed a bug, a complicated bug involving pointers and arrays and crap while sleeping. And I wake up and I write it down or I go on the computer and I just type it because I'm nuts. Yes, bicycle accident, six years old, no helmet. Ripley, always wear a helmet when you ride your bike. That's what it's all about, okay? But, um, there are so many other things that have to get done, even just for a, a simple software plugin. And we're gonna talk about them right now with some very high tech slides. Are you ready? Okay. So we talked about development. That's me. Okay, great. Right, I got an idea, I'm writing code, things are great. Right, Ripley, you like this picture? No, maybe so. Okay, great, fine. But there's more. You need other people, not the developer to do Product testing, oh, you know, it was really loud and it hurt my ears or it sounds like crap or it's exactly what I wanted or when I turn this knob, the other one moves, all that kind of stuff, right? Okay, but we're not done. Even if you were to get that product shipped and out there, well, wait, you need people to do support, answer phones, because you might have made the most amazing audio gadget ever, but guess what? Some people won't know how to use it. How do I authorize it? What's an iLock? Does it work with Pro Tools and Fruity Loops? Oh, you need people to help you with that. Same kind of stuff, right? Maybe the person in support didn't write the code, but they sure as heck know how all the plugins work, like intimately. That's exactly right. You could use the Emmy Award winning SA2 dialog processor on your vocal track, because it's the same process, you know? It sounds amazing. It's also going to violins. Okay, great. Right. Okay, oh. It and then, oh yeah, you still have to convince, and then you're convinced it was great. Everybody in your company's convinced it was great, but yeah, you gotta convince everybody else. There's marketing, one, 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 one. see, it's like a screen. It's also a picture of the S dog buster. Marketing, and marketing again, you have in this kind of like a field, the person that they're really gonna market it probably should have like some engineering background or at least be intimate with like what the audio production process is. Like, oh yeah, I know, yeah, I know you recording your tracks. I'd always use a Sure SM7B when I do a dialogue, duh. Theremin, of course you tune it up with it muted. That way you get the right pitch and you unmute it. As at the Beach Boys, good vibrations, he's a theremin. Everyone's like, okay, right? Okay, sorry, sorry. And, and yes, the guy really had like a muted, like he had like a switch that the live sound person made for him to mute himself. So he put in his headphones so he could hear it. And then he'd unmute himself and then he'd turn it and then people would, he'd like start in the right, the right key as opposed to going, finding the right pitch. He's fine. Okay. Marketing, talking to other people about the product to tell them why it's cool. Oh, but we're not done. Cause you know, this is the modern age. So you have things like social media. Cause apparently some people, teenagers, they're like on social media all the time. Not my kids though, yeah. Anyway, but you know, Facebook, Twitter, all that stuff. Someone needs to like sort of be, and this is another whole thing in itself. Familiar with like, you know, what are the good Reddit chat groups? Or what are the good Facebook groups to be a part of or talking to or talking about products and talking to people about those products that you're making. And again, it comes back to, you have to have the understanding of how the product worked. You know, maybe Colin didn't side of the circuits that Nicole put together or Ripley did, but I know exactly why they're cool. And I can talk about those points and that's important. Okay, fine enough. There's also a for short, 
artist relations. There are famous people out there. The band Rush. They don't tour anymore because Neil's dead. That's really sad. Anyway, but the point is, is that there are people out there who are like, and, and this is like a thing. People are like, oh, why would I give like a famous person like free stuff? And, and a lot of people, no, they should totally pay for it. They have like a house in the hills of LA with like a garage that holds like nine Ferraris. They should totally pay for everything you make. However, some of those people do not have the time to learn new stuff. It's almost like a, a specialized type of marketing where you're taking the famous person to the side, saying, hey, Amanda, how's it going? Yeah, Amanda Hernandez here. Yep, I got seven Grammys in my first uh, two months in LA. I'm doing pretty good. I don't have time to learn any new software. I want to hear about the ATV. Well, I'll bring one by your studio and I can give you a personal demo. That sounds great. And, you, and that we actually hire somebody who lives in LA whose job it is solely to drive around ATVs and go, this is what it is. This is how you plug it in. This is how it works. It's so easy. You're right. It's so easy. Okay, I'll buy four. And that's how it works. But they, that, that artist never would have done that had not had that personalized demo. And that person who gave that demo, the only reason that that demo was compelling is because they knew how the product worked. So maybe they didn't have a degree in computer science or double E or double ET or whatever, but they knew audio production. They knew what the product was about, why it was cool. They knew how to drive Pro Tools because this client happened to use Pro Tools a lot so they could go in there, they fly through Pro Tools and show they were legit. Making sense? Okay, great. Which also is the last topic, product specialist. It isn't quite marketing, see, he's going, whoa, wow, amazing, I'll buy two, which actually happens sometimes when you show people an APB, they buy two, right? Oh, okay, well, it's really expensive, it must be good to all buy two, right? Oh, uh, yeah, however that makes you, decide, that decision for you, great. But um, I suppose there are a bunch of things there. My point is, is that there's a bunch of other roles, even outside just the product development umbrella. Does that make sense? So, you know, maybe you wanted to solder circuits all day, or write some code, hey, that's great, but there's still a bunch of other things that go on that take other things. We talked about scripts. Oh, now we're going. Let's back up. Ooh, back over to the uh, development guy. Where is he? There he is. Development. We're talking about this. Okay. Well, there's writing the code for the algorithm. That's one part. There's writing the code for the interface. That's another part. There's, oh, I mentioned the builds machines, right? I don't give people a copy of the plugin from my laptop I use for development. We have a whole another fleet of machines for Mac and Windows whose only purpose in life is to build the software. And what do they have in them? They are a highly scripted environment. If it's on Windows, it uses something called Sigwin. That's C-Y-G-W-I-N, I think. And Google that. That's a Unix environment. You can run on top of Windows. If it's on the Mac, the Mac comes with a Unix environment. And so we use like Perl or Bash or other combinations of those scripts to not just build the software, but we'll use like a source. Oh, geez. Well, we build the software, build the installers, add the presets to the installers, give the build like a version number. Cause you know, oh wait, is this like version like, you know, 6.8.9 or 6.8.7? Maybe it's 6.8.10. I don't know what it is. Oh, God. It does all those things for us. Well, only because somebody spent upwards of a year to put that system together. So wow, like you get that, yeah, that, that was like the guy's like life for like a year. And by the way, he went to Stanford, had a master's in double E. He's like, I'm doing scripts. I'm like, Dude, we got to get it done. There's nothing to do about it. You can do this. You can do that. You got to choose. You got to choose. You got to choose. Can I do the convolution engine for Revolver because it's really cool and mathy? And the script. Yeah, fine, fine. Do two things at once. I don't care. Just get it done. Ah! Right? So that's mostly how I talk when things are really stressful at work and a little bit louder sometimes, more animated. Anyway, so there's that. Um, oh, I skipped one. Um, ah, source control. I talk about this, right? Like, imagine if like, each person in this meeting had a copy of one of those pieces of code I showed you. And we all make a change. You know, someone adds a knob, someone adds a new control, someone makes a new meter. How do we merge all those changes together in the same file? That's called source control. Um, we use a system called Perforce. That's pretty common. There's some other ones too. But um, even if you have a little bit of experience with source control, that's a huge bullet point on your resume because that tells like a potential employer that oh actually i know that writing code isn't just like yeah i got some stuff in a laptop i'm just gonna boop put it out into the internet people are gonna buy it right cool no so in fact like at, at avid where i used to work there were two people whose full-time job it was year round was to maintain the source control for all of avid's family of products pro tools every plugin every driver for every audio interface 
Everyone remember session eight? Yeah, I'm that old. Yeah, session eight or whatever else. Yeah, oh, yeah. one person's like, oh my God. Yeah, yeah. So all those things, source control is a whole other thing where the person maybe had a computer science degree. Actually, one of the guys did it. He had a PhD in pharmaceutical chemistry and he played way too much guitar. He had like every, I swear, every week at work, he had a new guitar and they were amazed. Oh, well, uh, this one's been untouched. It was, like, it was like Spinal Tap. This one's not been touched by human hand. It's purple. It matches the purple hue of my Soldano purple blah, blah cabinet. I'd go, wow, I thought I had gear issues. I mean, he was a great guitar player, so he deserved it, but just kind of like, you know, and you are, I'm in charge of all the source control systems. Oh, okay. And he also had kind of the obsessive compulsive nature about him. So he was great at writing scripts and also getting all of us basket case engineers like me at Avid or DigiDesign back in the day to check in all our code so we could do a build and, and build Pro Tools and stuff. So I ramble there. So I talked about so there's product testing, support, marketing, um, social media, RS relations, product specialists. I talked about people who just maintain the build system or people who maintain the source control system, other jobs. I skipped a few other jobs. Graphic artists, people who like to draw. Now, there's lots of people that like to draw. Um, I like to draw, and as you can see, definitely not my day job. However, um, sometimes people who like to draw, they like things like say, like audio equipment. I, I showed you that 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 render, final render of the stuff. So that person, her name is Boomika. Um, yeah, she's kind of into gear. She's not really into audio gear per se, but she's into like equipment. And so you say, oh, it needs to be like this. It needs to be like a ceramic, slightly polished, but with the beveled edging. Oh, I got you there. Sometimes she asks me things like, will it have a camphor? And I'm like, what's the camphor? Well, oh, that's like an extra edge between the primary edge and the secondary edge to make it look a little more, oh, I don't think I want a camphor. Is that what I say? And so, but right. So there was a person, not a doubly, not a math person, not a computer science person. They were into equipment, weird. And they're also a graphic artist. So guess what they can do? They can draw equipment. Hey, do you ever hear of a plugin? No, what's that? Well, it has like knobs and stuff. And so, yes, yeah, so she works for us. Does that make sense? So, and that whole rant there, I'm trying to get there's a ton of other things, but nothing grows in a tree that we can pick. Up. Oh, we needed a thing or a thing. We have to make it ourselves. So, whether it's an installer, oh, you know, the installers, just making the installers, that's a whole other job. Because, right? Oh, well, this and and generally, yes, once you make an installer template, you can use the same installer template for every product, but someone has to make those and then someone gets to maintain those. Sometimes what we do is like, we'll mold all those jobs, the uh, making the installers, maintaining the source control system and doing the builds that will roll into like one person's role here. Cause we're like a smaller company. We just do plugins because kind of all the builds are all the same. At a larger company, Digit Design, well, guess what? Or sorry, Avid, you know, they will have like, you know, a team of people that does that stuff. Yeah, boom, 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 boom. so there was that. So in that part of my seg that segment of my presentation, which I hope said that there was like overview development, I went to the other jobs. That was the other job segment. That was just about there's a litany of other jobs um, that are out there. Um, also within within like the that marketing umbrella, you know, there's people who like do marketing, like trying to convince people the product is cool. There's people that's talking to end users. There are people who talk to the dealers because right, you can tell. You know, I convinced Nicole that the product was cool. But Ripley, her dealer, kind of weird, two-year-old selling stuff to her mom, but yeah, whatever. You know, Ripley, the dealer is like, oh, I didn't think it was cool, so we didn't carry it. So Nicole couldn't buy it. So there's other people who do marketing to just talk to the dealer network to make sure that dealers are in the loop about what's new, what's cool, what they should be pushing, selling, stuff like that. Um, what else did I skip? Oh, geez. And this sounds like really lame at first, but then anyway, wait, order processing. You're like, wait, what? Like taking people's orders all day? Yeah, sort of. Hold on. Yes, we have a website that does most of the stuff automated and everything. But a lot of the dealer orders come to us over the phone. And in that, you have people like, oh, this is like so and so from Skywalker Sound. We need like 64 SA2 dialogue processors stack. Can you make that happen? Well, uh, yeah, I need you to deposit it directly to this account. You got to talk to so and so and so and so. Get that stuff done today. We're starting a movie tomorrow. We're rebreaking, we're bringing back the Star Wars franchise. Okay. So there's some of that. Or just sometimes the support. Is not from like the, you know, my iLock doesn't work or what does this knob do? It'd say, hey, I ordered this thing, but I didn't get it. And so can you help me with that? And then it doesn't sound too awesome. However, I will tell you that there are people I've talked to like, you know, 20 years ago, I remember that guy with a thing, with a time, with a thing, and I helped him with the thing. And like, yeah, we come by the NAM show, dude, you're the guy who helped me with the thing, with the thing, with the thing. 
I got seven Grammys now. I live in a house in the lake. I have seven Ferraris. You should come by my studio sometime. I'll hang out. Okay. I bought everything that you make five times over. Just cuz. Sure. Let's take a photo together. Okay. And so like you show up on somebody's Facebook page and it's like some famous person. Well, I have a picture with this guy with the McDS t-shirt. Who is that? I don't know. I was looking for Nicole, but she wasn't there. So this Colin guy was like my second choice. Right. So, so anyway, but you get the idea. Is it, is it so? And I think that's something about working in the audio industry uh, in general. It, it, it is a very much a niche industry. So in one way, it's hard to get in. But if you do get in, you know, everybody has kind of like walked that same path that you've walked. So they're if you, they're they're keen to help you out or they're keen to know who you are or if you've helped them, they're keen to help you. There's a lot of that that goes around. I think that's something I'm not sure it's, if you, it's unique to audio industry because that's the only place I've really worked. But um, there's some of that. Um, there you go. Um, who? I'm like, our moderator's like, wow, this guy's a basket case. It's okay. It's fine. Um, anyway, um, uh, but um, so there. So I wanted to cover lots of jobs there, uh, and and there I think I covered. Oh, I skipped one. Website. That's that's programming. P.S. By the way, you might think, oh, I just use Wix or Oxygen or something. Or WordPress, right? You just poop out a website. No, because guess what happens? The marketing person says, oh, I use Photoshop to make this really cool, amazing looking page. I get everybody to buy in on it. So now can you make it actually really happen on the website? And you'd be like going, yeah, sure. I'll do that. Oh, I skipped another job. Copy protection integration, right? If it's software, you have to put some kind of layer of copy protection on there. We use Pace. Not everyone's a fan of Pace. Whatever. We use Pace. That is actually, that is, um, that's, that is almost a full-time job. I would say software piracy is pretty horrible out there. So you have to take time to protect the products. So we're always having to come up with new ways, new strategies to make sure we're balancing complexity of the copy protection integration with getting products out the door, done, 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 all that. Um, but then also like back to the website, the website actually and the pay stuff go together. Cause like if someone buys a, a subscription from us, we have to like send the subscription authorization to their iLock over the internet in some secure manner, right? Just, just happened like my magic. And so we do that, right? So that's like another whole person's job. So ramble. Anyway, I just ran down a bunch of detailed stuff about different types of jobs. And I'm sorry if that was too fast or too like basket casey. I'm almost trying to get, I mean, obviously I, I still get excited talking about all these things because that's what we do here every day. It's so amazing sometimes. Um, but um, I wanted to emphasize that there are lots of other jobs out there besides just writing the code. Um, cause some people maybe get sad. Oh, I wasn't the person who got to write the plugin. I'm like, um, okay. There's still like, you know, 15 other jobs to do. And some of them are also pretty darn cool. Um, and so, uh, you know, when the ESP started, it was just me out of our, one of our bedrooms in our house. And so I wore all those hats and a lot of those jobs had their kind of low points and some of their high points. So we just kind of know that this all kind of out there. And, um, there you go. I maybe just, to also build a little bit on Nicole's question about the OMO, a, a EET instead of an EE or whatever. Um, I'm, I'm a guy, you know, so I don't really know how it goes for women when you try to get these jobs out there. I am married and I have a wife who's like, you know, you want intimidating? I could call my wife and hear it out, but then I, I'd be scared and she might make me cry. So I'm just not going to do that. But, you know, she very much has lived, the, you know, what do you mean I can't do this? Because am I effing smart enough? Because I already have three patents on AI. I'll put crap on Mars. You can go F yourself. I'm taking you down right now. Well, hold on, honey. She doesn't really swear like that, but her eyes and her glare, that's totally what she's saying. So you're kind of like, oh, okay. Hey, before my wife force chokes you, you should just like stop talking. So I've had some conversations like that. Or like we take our kids to school. You know, girls really aren't good at math and science. Okay, pretend my wife didn't hear that. Oh, too late. And then like, you know, 10 minutes later, my wife's like, you know, made some other mother cry or father cry. Cause you know, you're shutting these girls down. So, so in my secondhand way, I've, experienced some of that. So I, I can't say that I really know what it's like, but um, I will say that just uh, when you encounter people like that, why would you want to work for them anyway? Just move on to the next group, team, company thing. Cause there are lots of places where we don't really care. Make the ESP one of them. I, I don't really care. You guy, gal in the middle, color your skin. I, I don't care. You know, maybe if you root for like the Buffalo Sabres instead of the Toronto Maple Leafs, you know, we might have some discussions cause the Buffalo Sabres are clearly a better team and Brett Hull's foot was in the crease. Discussion over. It's a hockey joke. You can Google that later. Brett Hull's foot in the crease. Yeah, just like, you can Google that later. That's like, that's like a thing. If you're from Buffalo, New York, that's like a, you can't, you're not allowed to live in Buffalo, New York, unless you 
are convinced that Buffalo should have won the Stanley Cup and that Brett Hull's foot was in the crease. Totally true. Anyway, um, but yeah, so I think just um, I always encourage people, if you encounter crap like that, just move on to the next thing. Um, my, own, my own daughter, um, uh, older daughter, um, she once made a varsity boys hockey team because it wasn't a girls varsity hockey team. And she didn't want to play with the girls. She wanted to play with the boys so she could make them cry. More or less her words with a few explicatives sprinkled in there, probably. And um, she did. And I, I told her, I said, if one parent complains about a co-ed locker room, I think you'll be done. So I'm just warning you. She's like, well, that's okay. I'll take that risk. And the first practice, the coach walked her into the locker room and said, this is Helena. She's a girl. Figure it out. And he walked out. And I was like, I like this coach. He kind of scares me like my own child, but it's great. And then, yeah, and then and it, was, it was a great experience for her because at the end of the day, the boys didn't care. I didn't care. They just wanted to win hockey games. And if Helena helped them win hockey games, they didn't care. In fact, in fact towards the end of the season, like Helena, because she's only like five foot two. So five foot two, with like, she's not, I'm built like a pencil. She's like a, they would like, you know, she would get like creamed into the boards. And so her teammates, who at the beginning of the season were like, I don't want an effing girl on my team, blah, 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 blah. They'd be like, hey. And so they'd try really hard to set up Helena to get the next goal. And then she did the deal. Hey, that girl scored on you. How does that feel, goalie? Let's go on Facebook. Next time you talk trash to a teammate, you're going down. I was like, wow, the whole team dynamic actually works. They don't really care because you put on a jersey, you have the same color jersey, your name's in the back, there's a number, they don't care. It was great. Sorry, I digress. There you go. So I, like that. Ice hockey. I, like, I like that you're talking about teams so much because oftentimes we think it's like one person and it's like, and not a group of people that supports each other and everybody has their own kind of unique area where they really excel and i think it's really important to to acknowledge that so much is created because of collaboration yeah and not just because of one person being like a genius or whatever right yeah and that's a yes not a genius my wife probably a genius but you know mostly you know it's just kind of yeah um but yeah no true it's true um another team example um the hockey team i'm talking about if people like play ice hockey or not, you know, like first line, second line, third line. So first line is like your best line. And so my daughter was not the best player in the team. She's also probably the smallest, at least in height, not in like muscles, but whatever. The coach put her on the first line with these two giant guys. And I'm like, you know, that means the other team is going to pair up their giant, like six foot three players with my kids. Like, yep. I'm like, why are you doing that? Because she's a great passer. They'll like think it's gonna be cool to like you know God body check the girl and she'll dish to one of the other guys and they'll be gone and they'll score all day. And I was like, oh, okay, but she's not as fast as them. Doesn't matter. I'm like, oh, all right. And that, that, that's the whole. I mean, I wish I had more cameras and iPhone clips of all these crazy things. My daughter, doo, doo, doo. I'm gonna kill you, girl. Hey, that's cool. Phew, dish the puck. My other guy's gone. He scored. It's great. I loved it. Sorry. I'm talking about my kids, pro audio, what are we doing here? Ripley, it's your fault because you kept coming into the frame. Oh, there's Ripley. I got to tell another kid story. But yeah, so um, on that note, I, had, I know that Sound Girls is, you know, partly it exists because you folks, I don't think you need, need help. You just need encouragement. And so I hope I've just given you that. I mean, and again, you know, if you encounter the people who are snobby or whatever, just move on to the next company because, you know, those aren't the ones you want to work for anyway. Um, and yeah, it, and for places like here at McDSP, kind of like a hockey team, we don't care. <laughs> it's like, are you smart? Would you want to do this job? Because we have this job and this job needs to get done like right now. Yes, we need new Windows installers with Inno Setup. Have you heard of Inno Setup before? Right, everyone's like, oh, sorry, that's I-N-N-O space S-E-T-U-P. Inno Setup is an installer package. It's actually uh, shareware, although you can pay them like an annual license if you want to. Um, it is an installer package that's used to replace one of the other more expensive installer packages out there for Windows. And um, it's pretty amazing. Uh, 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 and uh, I don't know. So if you had experience with that, if you're making a Windows product, and you want to eat an installer for your Windows um, stuff, I recommend uh, that product. It's pretty darn good. On the Apple stuff, you only get to use Package Maker. It's made by Apple. They control it. You're just at their mercy. It's like, cool. You guys took away the user interface of package maker. Now it's all the command line. Yeah, command line's great. You'll love it. Unix scripting stuff. Well, that's really cool. But I have all these other projects, like 79 of them that have the old way. You'll just have to convert them. Okay. I wish we could hire somebody right now that would do that for me, but we can't. Thanks, COVID, whatever stuff. Anyway, um, was that sufficient? That was kind of my like, you know, basket case persona talking about a little bit about me, who cares? Development, interesting. And then all the kind of jobs 
and I'm sure I've, I've, I've missed some. Um, yeah, oh, geez. And if you're making hardware, there's like the person who designs the hardware, generally super experienced person. Sometimes they have an assistant to help them chase down lots of other smaller problems. There's a person called usually mechanical engineer that handles the mechanical or um, design, like the physical like metal box that the thing's gonna fit in. And that's like a thing. That's like a thing and a thing. It's like, oh, well, our board's gonna be this big because the capacitor is, you know, I don't know, five centimeters high. Well, they'll have to you know, add at least another, you know, two centimeters to the top of the pedal to do the thing with the clearance and the stuff. And you're like, yep. And so that those are other other jobs. I don't even, I, yeah. So I could tell you more about those jobs, but I know it's a little. I just go, can we make it a little thinner? And I go, oh, oh, you really want it to fit in one rack you space? No, it'd be better because you know one U rack space is cooler than two except for temperature, things like that. Yeah, anyway, ramble. Um, stuff, okay. Um, oh, there was, and anyway, cut me off anytime. A lot of people ask me, well, how do you, get, I've talked about some of the things I know or skills and things like that. People ask me, how do you get started? Um, my basic answer to all those people ask, how do you get started? Just find the companies that make the stuff that you like Avid, Universal Audio, Waves, Line 6, Spectrosonics, Sequential Mo, whatever. They got a website. They probably have a contact or a jobs posting thing. Just email them. Find someone to talk to. Because even if the HR department hasn't posted a job, that does not mean that somewhere there's some manager, some department going, dang it, I could really use an EET right now to help me fix this. Someone that liked lots of bread in their background. Something. I just, ah, right? It'd be like that. So, you know. But what if they have a kid named Ripley? Otherwise, we're not hiring them. Okay, what? You know, so so stuff like that. Um, yeah, uh, if if people are still in school, computer science is a pretty handy degree because lots of programming jobs are out there. Um, Double D is fun if you're kind of a little more glutton for punishment and like circuits. Uh, um, applied mathematics. Um, that's kind of like you know use of math to do certain types of problems. That's what my wife does. Our, um, and that's had lots of jobs out there. Physics, you know, waves, audio, kind of the same stuff. Um, but just the way things that you like to do. That's what you should be studying and pursuing. Um, oh, last thing, I'll shut up and take QA. People ask me, well, I can learn how to program, but how do I get good at it? And the answer to that one is it's just practice, practice, practice. Write a hello world, write a numbers guessing game. Write a little, I, when I was like 12, or a DD game, you know, it's all textual based, like you're in a tunnel. You can go north, south, east, or west. Which way do you want to go? And it had like a big like logic tree about you know where you'd find through the castle at the end. Yeah, and um, it was a mess, but um, did that you know, and it was fun. Um, so so just just practice. Um, and yeah, and even with the last thing, the interviews. If you have an interview that goes badly, just move on to the next one. It's like it's like ice hockey goalies. If they have a bad game and someone scores five times in them. Their best thing they can do is just forget about it and move on to the next one. You just interviews take practice too. Or if you want to practice, get one of your friends and practice interviewing. You know, one of them can play the obnoxious, you know, hi, I'm the male manager. Hi, honey, what's your name? You know, do that. You know, just to get you. My God, there's one. Okay, I got to tell them. No. So, so, right. So, practice six things. So it's one story. Now be quiet. How did I meet my wife? Because now you're wondering. And this is exactly how I met my wife. I was in a meeting at IBM while we're wearing suits and ties. It was the 90s. And we're talking about, this department, and this is like a big computer system we were working on for the government. And there was a department of sort of newcomers that was sort of taking all the code, responsibility of all the code from the older people, some of whom had been around since the 70s. So they, they were getting ready to retire. And this one guy, Bill Broman, God bless you, Bill Broman. He was like, he was a nice guy, but like the whatever, like, you know, politically correct stuff. Yeah, he, he like, he was way before that. So it's like, hey, little honey, little lamb, whatever. That's how he talked. You know, he also talked with analogies. Like we looked at this bug in the software. He'll like, oh, this bug, this bug here's like a dead cat nailed in the wall. Somebody did it. And we're going to find out who, who has a hammer. And then, right, that, 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 that was him. We're like, you know, powder blue suit with cowboy boots and like a mustard yellow tie. You're like, oh my God. And so I was at this meeting and Bill Broman, who was in charge of some pretty important stuff for this IBM mainframe project, was handing things off to another department headed by Diana Lee, my future wife. And they were having an argument and it was kind of scary because he kept saying, well, little honey, little lamb. And she, and she kept going her down away. This is how we're going to do it, Bill. This is how we're going to do it. Like, well, gonna, what about the, you don't know enough about that. Oh, we've done that, Bill. We've done six simulations that over six months. Ding, 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 back and forth. And finally, Dinah said, tell you what, Bill, 
I'm going to let you talk for two more minutes. And then we're just going to do it my way. And the whole room was like silent. Cause this guy, and this, this guy was like, like smart. Like if there was a genius, like texting guy, this was the guy. And the room was like, mm. and he looked at Diana and said, well, okay. Oh, my phone. Sorry. And he said, okay, Diana, we'll do it your way. And that was it. And for the rest of the time before he retired, he always called her Diana. And anybody else that would go into his office say, you know, but I was thinking, and he turned and go, don't try to pull a Diana Lee on me. You're full of crap. I don't want to see your face. Get out of here. He'd be like, okay. And the last time I saw him was in the parking lot. And I was leaving work. And he said, Colin, hi, Bill. I hear you're engaged, Diana. Yes. Yes, I am. Wow. Good job. You're not as dumb as you look. Well, see ya. That was it. But um, that was clearly a thing of my, my first, my, my most firsthand experience of sort of a male chauvinist thing. But the woman just kept pushing along. And at some point he realized, wow, she is smart. I should give her some respect and shut up, which I still work on sometimes with my own wife. I'm sorry, Diana. But um, yeah, so I don't know. I, I, yeah. That was a ramble. You can probably cut that part out. I'm sorry. But I'm um, mostly trying to encourage everybody to keep going after it. You know, if it's important to you and you like to do it, keep doing it. q and I'll shut up, maybe. I'm out. Yeah, there's some really great Great, great uh, question. Sorry. Uh, Amanda asked one in the chat, just if, if you have any um, ideas to get your feet wet with C++. And I think there was another one on the registration with like uh, to do with if there is a particular order of what you should learn first in terms of programming languages and if it's maybe even possible to do this stuff like self teach yourself. Like teach yeah. yourself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, that's I'll start with the operation order of operations. That's an engineering kind of thing. Um, I'd say learn C first because it's easier. C++ is the same thing as C. They look the same. Just C++ takes the idea of like, you know, you have a widget and you like, you know, like, I don't know, a, a box and you connect into the box in certain ways or the, the piece of code, but what's inside the code, you have no idea what it is, which is why object oriented is actually kind of compelling to people. It's like, oh, I can make like a, like I showed you, I showed you like there was one object, like the parameters object that had all the parameters. There was one that had all the UI, but the UI doesn't know the details of the parameters, just talks to it and says, hey, turn your control. I don't know what you do. And the parameters is like, hey, UI, update the knob to this value. I don't know how you do it. So, but I start with C and C++. If you get kind of a handle on that, you can look at SDKs like Juice. Again, I caution everybody, Juice is like a ton of code. It's like a ton. So don't get flummoxed with that. It just, it's just trying to do many things all at once, but it is very useful once you kind of get a handle on it. Then as far as teaching yourself, just, um, this is how I did it. Um, it just had a bunch of programs and it had like one that was like, you know, hello world. It had another one, like a guess my number. So like you just generated a random number and you made some text prompts and hey, what's my number? And you'd guess like, you know, if you was higher, it would say, oh, you're too high. If you're low, oh, you're too low. And just go in a loop until you guess the right number. Hey, 55 tries, you're an idiot. But you know, then it would, you know, go on. So, so other programs like that. Um, and I think a lot of online programming courses for teaching yourself, I think some of them are, are pretty good. I don't really have a strong opinion about which ones are better or worse, but you can definitely learn a lot from, from some of them. Just, just start up with, just start in simple, deliberate steps to just say, just do that. Does that make sense? Did that answer that question? Sorry, Amanda. Yeah, I think. Thank you, Dave. Oh, Amanda had to hop off too. I'm sorry, Amanda. We're recording this later, I think. Oh yeah. Um, look at you, Arduino uses C. Okay, fine, no deal. Um, gosh, I did go, oh, it's already 1230. I'm sorry, it's just, you know, I get excited, I go on. This is why the NAMM show for me is great. I just talk like for 10 hours a day, standing. People are like, how do you do it? I'm like, do what? This is great, what time? Oh, it's already 6 p.m.? Oh man, the show's over. Um, how about other questions I should be answering? Oh, well, I could ask a, lo a lot about. Um, so I, I kind of wanted to work, ask a little bit more about like how, how um, okay, sorry, I have to get myself oriented now. So are you achieved? Are, are you, oh my goodness, I hope they can edit that out now. <laughs> Am I a, um, are you, <laughs> what are you currently working on? How about that one? <laughs> oh, um, lots of things all at once. 
Currently, uh, we just wrapped up, really just, just to give you an idea of the variety of things that we do. Um, we just wrapped up putting together new Windows machines. Um, so our builds could be faster. Our, um, our builds for our tiny company take hours, if not days, just to do one build scripted with lots of computers networked together going, mm. so we just upgraded all those computers for a newer system. It looks pretty good. We have our builds time down to under 10 hours. So that's what I did this summer. Plus we upgraded all our installers to a different product called Inno Setup, which I mentioned. But I mean, probably wanna, what kind of products am I working on? Well, there's this company called Apple. Maybe you've heard of them. And they decided, hey, you know, there's a global pandemic right now, but I think we should introduce a new hardware platform to the world. Might be a good idea. Yeah, let's do it. So the M1 or Apple Silicon computer stuff, we've worked, been working a lot on that. Um, so again, is that making new products? Nope. That's just writing code or making code work different ways to accommodate Intel processors and Apple processors. Woo, that sounds like a thrill. Yep, sure was. Um, for other new products, um, hmm, uh, I think you know, the most recent plugin I worked on was probably the Royal Mu and the Royal Q, that user interface I showed you that shipped earlier this year. That was the latest uh, a dual compressor limiter and a dual channel equalizer for the APB. Um, I think right now we're looking at some things, maybe Atmos. Uh, Dolby Atmos is kind of a thing that's, that's like object-based mixing kind of system. There are a lot of uh, post engineers or music engineers who are trying to figure out lots of ways to leverage what Atmos is or, or other types of object-based mixing into what they're doing for productions. I mean, I'm, I'm older, so I think like, you know, stereo, it's good enough for me, but I think a lot of people are trying to figure out new ways to um, take 3D audio, if you will, and, 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 and take some of those capabilities into their mixes. And then when they figure something out, they go, McDSP, or their favorite plugin developer, we need a thing for a thing with this thing. Come by the studio and I'll tell you all about it. Hmm. Okay, that sounds almost kind of cool. Are you vaccinated and do you wear a mask all the time? Cool, me too. Okay, I'll come by, right? So that's that's kind of the, did that answer your question? Or, or? Yeah, a little bit. Sorry about the awkward question. You have a one plugin called the channel G surround. Is that kind yep. of, so is that object based as well? Uh, no, that's um that's kind of, a, uh, because McDSP has been around like me since dinosaurs roamed the earth. Some of our plugins are like are 15, 20 years old, but they're still like used a lot. So Channel G Surround, this is weird. At the time we did it, it was only a 5.1 compressor. You know, so it's, it's the 5.1, you know, it was the, uh, left, right, center, left surround, right surround and the LFE channel. Yeah, right. Um, but it's just, it's just a compressor. It's based on Channel G, which is a, a Tech Award nominated product from like 2003 that simulated a bunch of, analog people are like all about, I want to simulate every analog large format console ever. Um, just FYI, Channel G simulates six of them like pretty, pretty well in my totally biased opinion. So you could just get that one plug in and well, moving on. But the surround version of it was meant to simulate some of those um, other large format uh, like compression modules of those big consoles, but also it broke up the surround channels into channel sets, so not objects, but channel sets. So you had the left and right, you had the center, you had the surrounds and the LFE. And we did that. So like on lots of movies, for example, the dialogue generally is in the center. And the people said, hey, when the dialogue happens in the center, it'd be really cool if I could duck the left and rights or something like that. So that instead of like trying to fight with like my volumes for like, oh, I have like my jet fly over and my, you know, amazing music soundtrack. And now the, the lead character goes, oh, Ripley, I think I need a cookie. And goes, okay, let's go get one, right? And, and, and as, this, as the, the person mixing the content, they're like, oh, I can physically, it's physically impossible to mix a whisper with a 120 piece orchestra and a jet flyby. So, you know, so something like that was to like sort of help, you know, duck a little bit of left and right. So the other surround channels, when an event occurred, the dialogue in the center channel. And that's what made channel G surround kind of popular for a while, but it's not object-based, but, um, but what I just described that type of scenario, those are the types of scenarios that people do in object mix, mixing or they're kind of, going, oh, I had this cool object, it flies over and my mix and my thing. And all of a sudden someone was cool, but the flyover, it was gonna be a butterfly. Now it's gonna be an F-16. Well, that's a jet and it's really loud. Yeah, it's gonna be great. But see, then it's gonna like, you know, crush the rest of my surround experience or 3D experience. So how can I manage that with some dynamics control or something? So we're talking to a few customers about that. 
Was that vague enough? I don't think I got myself in trouble. That's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, and, and that's something else. Even just product, gosh. Uh, I had there was there was the product specialist person or the marketing person or the support person. I think oh they don't get to work with development. Actually they do because you know customers will call and say I love this product, but you should make one that does the thing with the thing with the thing. Why don't you do that? And of course then we log that into our customer support database. How many people ask for the thing with the thing with the thing? And some go oh there's a trend here. We have like 50 people a month asking the thing with the thing with the thing with a button. You need to make a button. I'm like okay so. Now, all of a sudden, that person who's in support, who's like, uh, yeah, dude, congratulations, you're in product development. What is it that they want? Exactly. Well, I think they want the thing, but not the other thing, you know, but the thing, right? Yeah. And the thing should go together with a thing. Are you sure? I'm pretty sure. Give me the three customers that ask for it the most, who seem to be the most knowledgeable, like, you know, not, not say famous, but like you actually know what they're doing, have a good, good discography and stuff. Get us their emails. Okay. Tell them we're going to do something. I want them to beta test it for us. Oh, okay. I'll talk to famous customers and help coordinate a beta cycle of a new feature that I kind of like came up with, or at least cobbled together from people's emails. Yes. So there's things like that where like that, that's, that's team thing, right? Is it, you know, I'm not, I mean, yes, I do answer my phone, but sometimes I don't because I'm trying to hide and just like write code. I'm trying to fix the bug today. Don't talk to me. La, 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 la. But someone else takes their phone call. That, so yeah, sorry. I talk a lot. Nicole's like, wow. And by the way, I don't, I don't, I avoid sugar and I, I don't drink caffeine in case you're wondering, like that's, that's not just a, yeah. Yep. And I'm actually married. Can you believe it? And my wife actually put up with this 24 seven. I know it's kind of weird. She's going to give me the look, the look of like, you know, stop talking. Okay. Sorry. I'm really sorry. Ugh. Anyway, back. Yes. Did I answer that uh, question? Yes. Yeah. And then one of, and please, if there's anybody else on the chat that wants to unmute and, and, and ask a question themselves, please go ahead and do it. I do have like, I just want to know a little bit more about this hybrid technology because it's what's fascinating me so oh. much is the fact that you have like, uh, a, you know, a plugin that actually works with physical equipment. And that, that to me is fascinating. I've always wondered how, to, how, especially with the different conversions with DB, like, how do you go from DBFS on a plugin to like DBU? Like, how do you how do you calibrate that properly? Like, these are and maybe we are running out of time to really. You, you get, give it to the hardware engineer. Like, you, you give that problem <laughs> to the hardware engineer and say, "Hey, good luck with that." By the way, I want thirty-two bit converters. Knock yourself out. Now, um, awesome. So, yeah. so I talked about object-oriented programming, like where there's like a box, and maybe the box has like some plugs into it. You don't know what happens inside the box, but you know what you want to send into it. So we got thinking like a long time ago at McDSP, you know, we have like, so like code I did not show you, there's like a parameters object, there's like a UI object, there's also an algorithm object. It's just an object. So why can't that object be analog? That's it. That's all you gotta know. Yes, there are problems with the calibration from like a digital DBFS to a DBU, whatever the hell, how many bits do you want in your converter? How do you time align the audio that goes off the analog domain, which is a real time, you know, real time analog system and bring it back into digital and everything perfectly aligned. Yeah, those are all some pretty major problems. Got a few patents about that now. Um, but the general idea is just, it's just an object. What is inside does not matter. And so we thought, well, why couldn't it be analog? And turns out we were right. So that's really it. Um, and, and then, yeah. And so, that's how it works. That's how the system works. It's also how it's programmable. Is it the analog system is its own thing and the digital system is its own thing. So you go, oh, we'd like you to be a compressor today. I can do that. We'd like you to be a limiter today. I can do that. How about a signal saturator? How about a thing with a thing with the feedback and a thing with, I can do that. Oh, I can't do that. So just some things obviously it can't do because it's analog. It's only have so many paths and things and nodes and whatever, but it can do a lot. So it's fun. There's also something again about the get into things, you know, that's just an idea, right? I just conveyed to you the entire concept behind the analog processing box, something we're working on for like six years. Um, it's been shipping for two years, but it took like four years to make. But, um, but you don't have to have a double E or computer science or an EET degree. I mean, you know, Ripley's like, oh, I understand that. Crayon, blue, I got it. See ya, you know, it's fine. Um, so I think that, uh, uh, that, that's just pretty much how it works. And, and that is how 
like what, what I want at McDSP or we try to do is, you know, there's ideas try to kick around. Um, a lot of the things we're working on are just problems we're trying to solve. Like how can we make better Windows installers? How can we support the new Mac hardware? Yeah, those are maybe not quite as exciting, but they're important to solve. Um, other times you're like, ooh, can we make an analog box that's programmable? Yes, we could. So yeah, sorry, ramble. That's great. Thank you. Thanks okay. for rambling. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, is this uh, Min, Layla, Michael, or 13139578308? I know who you are, but if anyone has a question, you know, uh, feel free. And for Amanda, wherever you are, I'm sorry I ran over your time limit. You probably had to go back to work or maybe you were flying the space shuttle. I don't know what you do for a living. No. Anyway, yeah. Oh, yeah. If your wife works at NASA, there are so many cool people you meet. You meet like astronauts, stunt pilots, they just work at NASA. You're like, cool, what do you do? Uh, I do not, I do anything. Something with audio, it's really boring. What do you do? Yeah, well, I used to fly this like back into the blah, blah, blah war, but now I do like simulator simulations for NASA. Oh, it's really cool. I'm doing a presentation tomorrow about how I used to like, you know, drop bombs out of a plane, had to go inverted and take pictures with my Nikon and film. You know, that's how we used to do it. Oh, okay, you should come by, it's really cool. All right, you know, so, or my wife's office mate who's a stunt pilot, so in some of her air shows, oh yeah, we, we know the person in that plane that's about to crash into the ground. Oh, oh, oh good, she's still here. I thought she was gonna crash. Yeah, it's crazy. Anyway. What do you what do you think you would have done if you hadn't gone into an audio related career? Just oh well, I, I really wanted to be a, a professional hockey player, but I'm built like a hockey stick. So that I by the time I was like 14 or 15, I was like, huh, I could die. I should probably stop doing this or like you know, take up a different sport like badminton or checkers. And it was very annoying because my younger brother, our, our, my, my, my dad was like a super athletic and super smart. Um, he got try offers for the, he's a baseball guy, but he has played football and basketball. He had like his, he's like Steph Curry for basketball. He's still like his high school somewhere like in central New York, but he's like still holds the record for the most number of baskets like in a single season, which he missed like a third of because he like, he got this infection in his leg and almost lost his leg because of some like, dis, like um, Germans in the floor, an old wood floor weird but anyway, he played football he was a quarterback and for baseball yeah by the time he was 17 the uh at the time the Brooklyn Dodgers had a special training camp for him and like five other kids at Cooperstown at the baseball fields near baseball hall of fame we have photos to check out these like pitching phenomenons and my dad was one of them if you're a baseball person also yes he could also hit so he hit the grand slam to win the game and also like you know pitch like six innings ridiculous oh and then he was also ridiculously smart he went to Cornell on a brain scholarship so yeah. So anyway, my brother got all those genes. So he's like, I had somebody who's really smart, huge muscles, and he played ice hockey. And I'm like, I can play ice hockey like Ian at some point. My parents are like, no, see, Ian's built like a truck and you're built like a toothpick. Please find another sport. So yeah. So I'm sorry. I answered your question. NHL hockey player didn't work out. Then I wanted to be a rock star, but you know, prog rock kind of lived and died and synthesizers became very popular in the nineties. Thanks grunge, whatever that happened. And so I decided to stick in school and I do this. Also a motivating factor for me in school because I was playing in a band um, through most of uh, my college experience. Um, and then the band wanted to move to LA to try to make it in LA. And I said, I can't do that. I want to finish my degree. So we had one more gig. And during that gig, the two bar owners shot each other behind our stage. Yeah. And, um, and we had to like, it was, and so after that, I'm like, um, I've seen enough. I've seen enough gig stories and, and nobody died. The guy got shot like, you know, some crazy number of times and still lived and his friends dragged him to the hospital and like, dumped him off and the police were interviewing us because we were sort of witnesses to an attempted murder. It was great. I had enough. I'm, like, I'm never going to, I have no need or compunction to play in public again, ever. I don't need to have anyone ever hear my music. It wasn't that good anyway. So we're just going to like, you know, I'm just going to sit at home making sounds of my sins. I'm good. Everything's fine. So that, and, and that year I got straight A's in school. I said, how do you know that band? Uh, I, I don't play in that band anymore. And I got straight A's and everything's fine. You know, we heard about this shooting outside of, uh, you know, school at that bar down the street. Did you hear about that? The two owners? Yeah, over at the blah, blah, bar. Yeah, that, that was terrible. Did you hear about that? Well, I didn't hear about that because I was studying the whole time and studying. I mentioned I have good grades. And when they finally came to visit me during like a spring break or something. But more or less, the conversation was like, hey, what's this hole in the side of your Pinto? Yes, it was a Pinto. Oh, that's a nine millimeter round. How would you know that? Well, because when the police came to recover the slug, they told me it's nine millimeter. Wait, why were the police recovering the slug out of your thing? Oh, 
that's too much information. Remember that bar with the shootout and the thing? Yeah, I might have been there at the time. I was at least 20 feet away when it happened behind a wall, playing my keyboards. I think we were playing Pat Benatar's song, Hit Me With Your Best Shot, I swear, up and down. That's the song we were playing. <laughs> oh, anyway. Good decision. <laughs> there you go. I, I, I don't know. I, I think that, um, I guess, if, if the whole talk thing, and I know I ramble a lot, and uh, but if you like audio or music or something, you know, those are the things you should do. Um, those aren't, aren't always like, you know, a great, some of those activities you cannot monetize and make into a living, but some of them you can. Um, and I think if anything, this, this conversation with you all today, and thank you so much for all your time is to just convey that there's lots of, you might get fixated on, oh, I wanna be like, you know, the developer guy, that's me, you know, but, but um, there's so many other jobs that are around it and there's such a big team. It, it's just, there's just a lot. And so, you know, what, if they're looking for a double E and not an EET, if you're computer science or your physical, whatever, whatever you're doing, if you just did a bunch of live sound engineering, you have like a good idea of what good audio sounds like and what bad audio sounds like. That's like a, that's like an actual skill. And believe it or not, you know, in four years, you can teach like, you know, computer science, double E, double ET, but you cannot teach like, you know, uh, what, what makes a drum sound, what makes a snare sound good. That takes longer, you know, all those things. So if any of you have all this experience or that you'd like lots of audio or you've already developed your own stronger opinions about music, that's really important because the last thing that like a company like McDSP needs is someone who has almost zero opinions about like the snare sound and like their favorite song. That, that, that should be you, right Ripley? That's right, Crayola. They discontinued like my favorite color of green. Why? There's like 12 shades of green in that Crayola box, but not the one that I like. It's just not cool. I know, I know, I know. It's, it's just makes me sad. Yeah, okay. Sorry, we're picking on Ripley today because, you know, she's the cutest and, you know, oh, that kids are so cute. That kids are so old. You know, my daughter actually almost broke my shoulder playing hockey. I, I tried to teach her checking once, one time. You're going to play this varsity team. My dad should show you how to do some body checks. After like 30 minutes, I'm like, daddy's done. And I think either separated my shoulder or it's dislocated. Maybe my collarbone's cracked. I'm not sure. We're, we're going home now. You're driving. I can't drive the car, dad. You can drive today. Don't tell your mother. Oh, wait, we're recording that. It's too late. Anyway, yeah, it was fine. Lots of ice and it went away eventually. Although if I go like this, sometimes my, my shoulder still pops. It's really kind of weird. I'm like, you know, that, that was you, Helena. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, not that tough. Helena, she's totally tough. And then and Sabrina, same thing. You know, Sabrina's like, you know, just, she would like, she did hockey for a while, but ballet went out. So she did a bunch of that. And it was great. Anyway, our kids did things that they liked, and that's what we try to encourage them to do the most. Um, Ballet dancers are really tough. They're on their toes all the time. Yes. That's a, that's a very active sport. Yeah, it, it's a good time. I have stuff. Anyway, I rambled. Um, any other questions I can answer for anybody? Uh, no? Okay. Oh, wow. Wait, geez. Oh. I had this note in my notes. It's like in fonts that are about this tall, like that's like, you know, 55 or 105 high fonts. Two things, two important things. First thing, McDSP, we offer internships. They are paid internships, like for money, every fall and spring semester. Now we're already filled up for the fall. Uh, the spring semester, there might be one opening. But so speaking of companies you might want to work at, duh. Oh yeah, McDSP, I forgot to mention. So we, we had this internship program. Uh, what, we're, what we try to do, because we're smaller, is we try to like, get some very specific roles or jobs or tasks, funnel them into an internship position, and then we post it. We find a good match. We hire the person. It's paid, paid. And um, yeah, and if it turns out maybe you're working out, maybe we'll keep you for more than six months, or maybe you work for us for six months. You're like, yeah, I think I've seen enough. Like, okay, cool. But it's a good way to get started with us. So I forgot to mention that. Wow, I'm an idiot. Um, so dumb. It's like, it's like, Diana, maybe that that was Diana's contribution to, to the poll presentation was right there. If you just said you have paid internships, you could just shut up. I'm like, yeah, you're right. I thought I should have done the first thing. So I'll wait till the end. I mean, you guys wait for two hours for that. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Okay, then the second thing is um, I know those advertisers have a giveaway, but instead, we're gonna give away a free plugin to each person that signed up. So if you signed up, um, I think um you've already provided your email. Um, if you could also then just provide your iLock account, just need a user ID, no, no passwords, just your iLock user ID. You can choose 
a Mac DSP individual plugin of your choice. Please don't use the everything pack bundle, which is everything we make. That's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about, you know, the 6060 ultimate channel strip, the module collection, or the SA2 dialog processor, or the A600 active EQ, one of those. Um, and we'll get you an authorization for that. Just give us about a week to turn it around. But um, I need you to email, however you signed up for this webinar, Zoom meeting chat thing, I need you to do that with the Sound Girls folks um, and they'll forward information to me and we'll provide you uh, one McDSP plugin of your choice. See, it wasn't a total waste of time. Oh, I got free software, that's cool. Maybe, Ripley's like, what about free crayons? What I can do with a plugin? I want crayons. And I want good drawing paper. I want like, you know, 24 pound white. That's what I want. Cause that'll last mom and you put it in a frame and it won't yellow over time and make you sad. It's true. Um, see, everyone's like, oh, what? And Nicole's like, that's really funny. I'm like, yeah, these are, these, and when you get, and so, and so if any of you, out of you have kids or if you have kids, these are all the jokes you'll have. All the other jokes you ever had, you'll forget all of them. But you have all these kid jokes, only make fun money to other people that have kids. And you'd be like, why is that funny? I don't understand. Did they really remove like the green 13 from it? Yes, they did. They used to be 13 change of greens, now there's 12. What the hell? So anyway, so it's like that. Um, but yeah. Yeah, so, okay. So that was free plugin for everybody. McDSP, paid internships. And in fact, even if you think, oh, there is someone for the fall, should I? please send us your resume. Please, for, for the, just the love of all things audio, if you have any inclination to work here or at any other audio company, just send us your resume. If you have an online website that has all your cool productions, or just, yes, anything. Does that mean we're gonna hire you? No, but it means you're in the queue of, oh, here's someone that had a thing. Oh, there's that EET that had the thing with the thing. And maybe they could help us out with that DBFSU conversion thing that I kind of ignored and gave to Glenn. He kind of hates me for it. Yeah, I know. Well, you know, it is something, you know, okay, cool, fine. Right, so yeah, yeah. Or even that, that exact question, someone's asked us, you know, well, we have like, I think it's, just to be nerdy, we have like a plus 22 DBU, I'm on a headroom in the APB processor. That's a crazy good, super high quality analog. But then some people still want to have more headroom based on how the signal goes into or out of the APB. <laughs> so, hey, Glenn, if you're listening, we might visit that again. Isn't that going to be awesome? It'll be like a feature in the plugin because it's programmable. Isn't that cool? Thanks, Colin. I'll oh, take Glenn now. Thanks, Colin. Thanks a lot. I'm the hardware guy. I also heard since because I can fix them myself. I will not react to this task you've given me just yet. But when I hang up this phone, I might open my window and scream at my neighbor, God gave me something else, it's just crazy. Um, oh, there was one other question I did not answer. And that was um, people asked about how does COVID impact our hiring and stuff like that? That's actually a really good question. Um, we closed our office uh, last March or last, a year and a half ago, whenever that was. So we all worked remotely. Actually starting this fall, um, we're trying to uh, work uh, in person in the office. Um, the office only has about five or six people in it. We're fairly socially distanced. So we're trying to, if people want to come like intern for us, we're trying to do it in person again, because a lot of this collaborative, like, you know, shaz about that goes on really is better when we're in person. Um, we do require vaccinations and you have to wear a mask. Um, we have like HEPA filters almost in like every 10 square feet of the office. Um, and we're in Santa Clara County, which is one of the more stringent, um, COVID restriction counties in all of California. So yay. Um, so yeah, so it is not helpful, um, but we're trying to sort of just make it work. Um, and I guess for the record, when we did go to COVID, we kept everybody and we just had them work from home. And uh, yeah, cause you know, it's probably kind of hard to get a job in a global pandemic. So we thought we wouldn't lay anybody off. So we didn't. Anyway, too much information, possibly. But yeah, so. There you go. Um, I can I thank all the people at Sound Girls. Thank you very, very much. I warned you, I talked a lot. It's been over two hours now and I'm sorry, but I hope it was worth it. Um, and uh, and thank you all for attending, especially you Ripley, because you're the best. Sorry, um, I am. sorry, it, the cute kids, well, you, you got, you, they, they just, you know, Bambi eyes. Oh, will you please get me another Pop-Tart, mommy? That's what they want to say and then they say it, but um. But yeah, I wish everybody also just the best of luck. Um, hopefully we'll see you at an AMP show at some point or, a, or I don't know, some award show. Maybe the next time there's like you know, one of those Cinema Audio Society or MPSC swanky shows in LA that they happen like the week before. Yes. Oh my God. So MPSC is one and uh, CS Cinema Audio Society is the other one. 
And these are like all the audio people that get together before the, um, um, all, the, all the other Academy Awards and they have their own award show. It's totally awesome because basically all the people you wanna bump into all at like one show. So it's like super networking opportunity. So that was MPSE and then CAS, Cinema Audio Society and Motion Picture Sound Editors. Um, they're like two like trade groups in LA. They're neat. NAMM show is great too, all that stuff. Bah. But um, yeah, there you go, networking stuff. Ah, uh, there you go. Um, but anyway, yeah, just, just try stuff and don't worry about it. Um, maybe one other, well, but my last story, not about me, I swear. Um, who mixes a Game of Thrones? Anybody? Anybody? All eight seasons. Who mixed all the sound for that? Yeah. 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 Ballet dancer named Annalie Blank. Because she used to be a dancer of New York City Ballet and then somebody injured her or she got injured. I don't know how. Probably one of her partners dropped her. But she's, she's a pretty high achieving person. She liked Pro Tools and audio. So she learned about it. And eventually she got this gig doing this pilot series somewhere like in, I don't know, the you know, coast of Ireland or something. You know, no one else wanted the job because it was like freezing cold and she did it for the first season. And she'd say, yeah, I made a bunch of mistakes and every night people would go home and I'd stay up till the late wee hours fixing all my mistakes, ready for the next day. And when the pilot filming was over, you know, or production was over, I figured I'd get fired because the show got picked up by, um, was it HBO or Netflix? HBO, right? And I got taken to LA and she figured they'd get somebody else and the director said, no. We want you because every time you made a mistake, you said, I'm sorry, and you fixed it. No ego, no hassle. That's what we want. You're coming with us. And so Annalie Blank, I don't know how many Emmys or whatever the heck she has now. And yeah, she mixed all eight seasons of that show. Super high achieving, smart person. There's, there's another smart person, right? Annalie Blank, yes, smart. But again, someone did not have a standard background with doing something completely different and had to change degrees and change, change careers. And um, yeah, um, yeah, that's a, she's quite a, there, there's, that's a role model right there. Not, not, not me. My wife, Dinah, Annalie Blank. Yeah, there's people. Ripley, okay, it's Annalie Blank, Ripley and, and Dinah Lee. Or uh, Helen McDowell, if you wanna be a hockey player or Sabrina McDowell, if you wanna do lots of dancing, that's totally fun. Yeah. I think you're allowed multiple role models too. Like, you, you possibly, know. possibly, <laughs> possible. I don't know. I just, I just, I just come to work every day. Ramble. Yes. Um, but, but thank you all again. I'm sorry I rambled. I talked too much. It's actually this, so it, much. this. This is the biggest meeting I've been in like in I think about six months. So I'm like, oh, people, my bad. But um, I mean, good luck everybody. Thank you. Carry on. Thank You'll you. You'll probably so have to edit some of this out. I'm sorry. So sorry. But thanks. Thanks for having me. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you for being here and thanks for everybody uh, who attended. And enjoy your plug-in. Don't forget to, to email, yes. to okay. email soundgirls at soundgirls.org. Thank friends. you, soundgirls, for hosting it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye. Oh, yeah. Bye, Ripley.